Rules Committee will come to order. Good afternoon. The United States continues to face a crisis at our southern border. The crisis takes on many facets. It's not only a national security crisis, although open borders have allowed countless uh, narco traffickers, potential terrorists, and criminals to enter in our country. It's not only a humanitarian crisis, although each month hundreds of thousands of migrants risk the dangers of crossing the border, often through deserts, and risk hunger, thirst, disease, and other threats to their health and welfare. Nor is it uh, only a legal crisis, although it has resulted in a widespread failure to enforce American law. The most salient feature of this crisis is in its creation. Indeed, the root of the crisis can be traced back to one person and actions taken immediately after he was sworn into office, and that's President Biden. Since, it is, uh, since then, it's only uh, been made worse by the policies pursued by him and those in his administration. Since entering the White House, President Biden has repeatedly acted to dismantle border security. He terminated the migrant protection protocols, terminated asylum cooperative agreements, ended the construction of the border wall, and refused to detain uh, inadmissible aliens at the border in violation of federal law, and ordered the release of millions of inadmissible aliens into the United States without any legal repercussion. The consequences have been stark and devastating. Under his watch, 9.5 million people have arrived at the southern border, more people than live in all but 10 of our most populous states, and over 6.4 million have been allowed to enter American communities. It is for this reason that we will consider two items related to this crisis today. This includes House Resolution 1112, a resolution denouncing President Biden's policies that have <coughs> created this crisis, and calling on President Biden and his administration to rescind these policies and implement policies that will end the administration's border crisis. We will also take up H.R. 529, the extending limits to uh, U.S. Uh, Customs Water Act. This is a bipartisan bill, unanimously reported out of the Ways and Means community, that will extend the authorization for customs and border protections, air and marine operation out to 24 miles off the U.S. coast, consistent with the contiguous zone of the United States. Extending the operational limit will enhance uh, CPB's ability to defend our coastline, enforce U.S. customs and immigration laws, and prevent narco traffickers and smugglers from entering the United States territorial waters. The Rules Committee will also consider House Resolution 1117, a resolution opposing one-sided efforts to force Israel into a ceasefire. Israel undeniably has the right to exist and the right of, to self-defense, full stop. On October 7th of last year, Hamas, a vicious terrorist organization, unleashed an unprovoked terror attack against Israel, murdering over 1,200 Israelis and kidnapping hundreds of others as hostages. Today, at least 134 people are being held hostage by Hamas, including at least eight American citizens. Yet last week, President Biden issued a press release calling on Israel to undertake an immediate ceasefire. This followed President Biden's decision not to use the United States veto at the United Nations Security Council to stop a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Israel is one of America's closest allies and has been designated a major non-NATO ally. The United States must be supportive of our ally as it fights against a terror organization bent on genocide. Today's resolution expresses the House position that it stands with Israel, supports Israel's right of self-defense, and opposes efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel for a ceasefire. Finally, the Rules Committee will consider the Reforming Intelligence and, Security America, and Securing America Act uh, as members are aware, Title VII of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act expires on April 19th. Today's measure will both reauthorize this important national security program and provide needed reform to prevent abuses and protect the civil rights of Americans. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this important matter today. I now yield to uh, my good friend, our distinguished ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. But before we begin, I want to share uh, some bittersweet news. Um, one of our senior professional staff members and director of member services, uh, Eric Delaney, will have his last day with us on Friday. Um, a Philly native and an alum of Bing Binghamton University, New York, 
Uh, Eric has spent over 18 years working on the Hill. Like many staffers, his journey began when he became a legislative assistant working for Representative Ted Strickland uh, and the people of Ohio. He spent eight years as a senior advisor uh, for member services under caucus vice chair and then chair Javier Becerra, and then served as legislative director for Representative Anthony Brown before joining the Rules Committee in 2018. Eric uh, is an integral part of our team. His dedication to public service, uh, skill as a coalition builder, fast problem solving, and quiet leadership have left an indelible mark on us. Um, and so we're sad to see Eric go, but excited to see what he accomplishes in his uh, new role at the Department of Energy. So on behalf of all of us, uh, Eric, I, I want to say thank you for your hard work and unwavering commitment to, to this committee and to this <coughs> institution and to this country. Um, and now moving on to the business of the day, we're here to consider four measures. The Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act uh, is the latest in a string of failed Republican attempts to pass a Pfizer reauthorization bill. Uh, we, have, uh, we have two weeks before the April 19th deadline to get this FISA reauthorization to the President's desk, uh, so let me say the quiet part out loud. Either Republican leaders don't know how to use a calendar, or we don't care about doing the job that we were elected to do. Uh, next, we have the Extending Limits of U.S. <coughs> Customs Waters Act, a bill that passed out of the Ways and Means Committee with a unanimous 37 to 0 vote. Um, it's more filler that should have been a suspension bill, quite frankly, yet we're wasting floor time on it because Republicans are fighting with Republicans and can't seem to get anything of substance done around here. Next, we have H. Res. 1112. It seems the uh, other side is finally ready to tackle immigration and border security with yet another non-binding resolution. It is basically the same non-binding resolution they've been passing over and over for months now. Isn't the definition of isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over but expecting different results. Let me just remind everyone, Republicans were the ones who tanked an actual comprehensive bipartisan border deal. And they did it because Trump asked them to, so that he could use the border as a campaign slogan in his election. So until they come to the table in a serious manner and work with Democrats to get something done, this is a Republican problem. Republicans and Trump own the border, they own the fentanyl coming in, uh, and they own all of it. Uh, finally, we also have a non-binding resolution opposing President Biden's recent comments calling for a ceasefire. This is a truly lousy attempt to divide Americans and score cheap political points. It's honestly kind of sick. Uh, there is a famine in Gaza right now. People are literally starving to death. Millions of people, including children, moms, and babies, are in grave danger, not to mention the 30,000-plus innocent civilians that have been killed. We all condemned Hamas and the October 7th terror attack against Israel. It was unconscionable. Can we at least acknowledge that when any innocent civilian dies, Israeli or Palestinian, it is a tragedy? Earlier this month, we saw seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen um, uh, aid workers delivering food get bombed. Uh, they were feeding people, and they got blown up. I think if you ask most Americans, there is a consensus on this. Israel has a right to respond, to defend itself, to go after Hamas. But Netanyahu's response has been over the top. It's been horrific, and it's been wrong. What kind of friend are we to Israel if we can't be honest? Because in my opinion, and in the opinion of a great many of my constituents and a great many people in this country, what Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing in Gaza has crossed the line and is actually hurting Israel, undercutting Israel's security, undercutting Israel's standing in the world. So I, for one, am proud that President Biden uh, is uh, doing what he can do to try to bring all this violence to an end uh, in a way that not only provides security for Israel, uh, provide some hope and some future for the Palestinian people. And I'm grateful that he has called for a ceasefire. Uh, again, uh, this, this meeting is, um, is filler. Uh, no substantive ideas from the Republican Party. It's just an attack uh, uh, against the president to divide the country uh, and complain about Democrats, even though Republicans are the ones in charge here. here. But hopefully that won't be for long. Uh, and so with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back my time. 
Thank you. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Chairman Jim Jordan and Ranking Member Gerald Nadler uh, from the Committee on the Judiciary, Chairman Mike Turner and Ranking Member James Himes from the Committee on Intelligence. Uh, Chairman Jordan, I would welcome your opening testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Good to be with you. A uh, year ago, 11 months ago, uh, the Washington Post reported that the FBI misused the 702 a database and surveillance program, the surveillance tool, misused it 278,000 times. 278,000 times they didn't follow the law and the rules that were already in place. The base text, the way this is going to work, um, the base text, the way this is going to work is there's some reforms in the base text um, that, uh, well, the way it's going to work is how you guys determine the way it's going to work when you pass a rule, or if, if you pass the rule. Uh, but the base text has some reforms that I think make sense, but I think the fundamental question still is if the FBI that wouldn't follow the procedures in place in 278,000 times didn't follow those procedures, our new requirements, whether it's in the traditional FISA or in the 702 program, going to be enough to safeguard Americans' liberties. So for me, I'm just going to cut to what I think is the most important. We were here two months ago. Ranking Member Nader and I had a robust discussion with this committee been a couple hours here talking about the various amendments in the, in the base bill, but the thing that I think counts the most is the warrant requirement amendment. That was in the base text of the bill that came out of our committee. Came out of our committee, by the way, 35 to 2, strong bipartisan, the strongest we've probably ever had in that committee, certainly in this Congress. Um, the warrant requirement, I think, is what's needed because when you have the history we have with this organization relative to not following the rules, we think you need a separate and equal branch of the government to look at, uh, to approve a warrant before you can query American citizens' information. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Um, we have exceptions built into our warrant requirement. If there's a, an imminent threat of data, that's an exception. If you agree to let the FBI, if you talk to them and say, yeah, you can, you can use my phone number, our email address to search, you agree to that. Or if there's a known cyber threat, some malware you know about, that's an exception too. But if you're going to look in this, what I call the haystack of information that is collected, which has Americans' information in it, if you're going to use Jerry Nadler's phone number or his email address, then you should go to a separate and equal branch of government to get a warrant to do so. That is how our system works. We think that is the fundamental thing. And frankly, I appreciate what we've got in the bill and in, in the base text, and those reforms are, I think, positive. But without the warrant, I don't think we've done our job. I don't think we've protected Americans in the way that we should. So for me, that's the key element. I know Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Nader will go through more of the legislation. I'm happy to answer questions. But that is what I think is the most important. By the way, let me say one other thing. I do think that the other amendments that I understand are being talked about, offered from the Intel Committee, and I appreciate the work that these guys do, but offered from the Intel Committee, those amendments actually expand FISA. And I thought what we were trying to do is reform it and protect Americans' liberty. So for me, the fundamental issue is the warrant requirement. That has to be in the legislation, or I don't think we've done our job. And with that, I would yield back to the chair. Thank you for your testimony. We now turn uh, to our good friend, Ranking Member Nadler, for any opening statement he cares to make. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you once again on the important topic of surveillance reform. As I've stated repeatedly throughout this process, it is long past time for Congress to rein in abuse of FISA Section 702 authorities by the intelligence community. Yes, there are already laws on the books designed to protect Americans from unauthorized government surveillance. But we know from our oversight efforts and the intelligence community's own reporting that these laws are often disregarded and are at the very least inadequate to keep this powerful surveillance tool in check. For example, under current law, intelligence officials must find it reasonably likely that a U.S. person query of the 702 database will turn up evidence of a crime or foreign intelligence information. But this is of little comfort if the FBI repeatedly and flagrantly ignores this and other rules designed to prevent government overreach, which we know to be the case. That is why a probable cause requirement, with reasonable exceptions, should be required to search for U.S. person information, such as an American's name or a U.S.-based phone number. Without such reform, I cannot support reauthorization of these authorities. The Judiciary Committee is tasked with reauthorizing Section 702, which sunsets next week. For over a year, 
We have worked on a bipartisan basis to study the problem of intelligence committee agencies' abuse of FISA powers and to analyze solutions for preventing government overreach while keeping Americans safe from those who would do us harm. We held multiple hearings and overwhelmingly passed bipartisan legislation to reauthorize Section 702 last December. Mr. Biggs' bill, which was co-sponsored by Chairman Jordan, myself, and many others across the ideological spectrum, was a balanced first step towards reform. And I want to thank Mr. Jordan and Mr. Biggs for being strong partners in the effort to achieve reform. And as Mr. Jordan uh, mentioned, this bill passed the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee on a bipartisan vote of 35 to 2. I can't think of anything else that passes the Judiciary Committee of anything like that. But our attempts to reform and reauthor Section 702 are beginning to appear Sisyphean. This is my third time appearing before your committee on a FISA bill for this Congress. Yet not one of these appearances has resulted in the House floor vote. While I remain hopeful that we will eventually enact common sense measures to rein in abuse of FISA Section 702 surveillance powers, I question the wisdom of repeatedly offering the same legislation and crossing our fingers that we will get a different result. <clears throat> this fe past February, I told you that while I didn't agree with the Speaker's approach of putting a neutral bill before the whole House and allowing Judiciary and Hipsy to fight over amendments, I was still willing to play his game. Two months later, nothing has changed. Except for a small change to the amendment process, the House bill still reflects a clear absence of agreement between Hipsy and Judiciary. And as with last time, rather than employing any of the other options available to him, the Speaker would have us vote on all of the items of controversy individually. This strategy is so unwieldy that if two or three of the expected amendments are adopted in combination, there may be nobody who will support the bill, depending which amendments are, 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 are approved. The modest reforms in the Reforming Intelligence of Securing America Act are indeed unobjectionable. But they are also so modest that they would prove ineffective. And we have the numbers to back that up. In 2021, in response to repeated criticism from the FISA court, the FBI instituted an internal reform for U.S. person queries of the 702 database. While these changes forced a 90% reduction in noncompliance, the FBI was still left with an average of more than 200,000 compliance incidents every year. The FBI's self-imposed query restrictions did not prevent searches for over 100 Black Lives Matter protesters. They did not prevent the batch query of over 19,000 donors to an unnamed congressional candidate. And they did not stop over 278,000 other noncompliant FBI queries of the, 202, of the, of the 702 database that occurred in 2021. The single most important reform we can enact to combat these abuses is a pop probable cause requirement, probable cause warrant requirement for U.S. person queries. One of the amendments you will see today would impose such a warrant requirement on searches using U.S. person identifiers with certain reasonable exceptions, such as cybersecurity cases, situations with victim consent, and in exigent circumstances. This warrant requirement is the reform we need to protect Americans and to allow surveillance laws to continue to keep us safe while also protecting our essential liberties. It is simply unfair to ask the intelligence community to both zealously protect our security while also protecting the constitutional rights of those surveilled. America's system of checks and balances exists precisely for cases such as this, where two considerations must coexist at odds with one another. For too long, FISA Section 702 has enabled the surveillance of Americans without adequate safeguards to protect our civil liberties. Americans need Congress to enact those guardrails. And with Section 702 expiring soon, we have a rare opportunity to protect Americans' privacy while giving law enforcement the tools they need to keep us safe. But we don't have unlimited time to get this right. The extension to Section 702 that the House passed last December expires April 19th, 10 days from now. I stand ready to vote on this legislation so long as a probable cause warrant requirement is adopted. And I encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting real reform. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now turn to my good friend, the Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Turner, for any opening statement he cares to make. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having us. Uh, we're very <laughs> pleased to be here with what is an excellent reform bill. 
Uh, Mr. McGovern raised the question as to why are we so late? Uh, this is uh, the uh, Section 702 of the Foreign Surveillance Act expired December 31st, but we've had this period of time where we have had to have serious review of the intelligence community's failures and their abuses of some of the most critical tools that we give them to keep our nation safe. And no question, we are here, as Mr. McGovern asked, because the intelligence community failed us. Uh, the FBI failed us, the intelligence community failed to properly police themselves, and they abused the, the tools that we gave them under FISA. There were searches of Americans' identities in the 702 database that should never have occurred. And there was a presidential candidate, ultimately President of the United States, President Trump, who had his own campaign team brought before the FISA court and actual warrants, probable cause warrants, issued in the, in the FISA court in what was the most egregious um, defrauding of a court system that we have had in our political system, where they went to the court and entered in what was basically political opposition research that had been paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee to obtain warrants to surveil an individual who was associated with uh, the Donald Trump campaign. We are here only this late because we've had to struggle with these abuses. These are not abuses of Congress. In fact, Congress is the one that ferreted these out. By law and statute, we required that the intelligence community report to us their uses of FISA and their searches of U.S. persons within the 702 database, and those abuses are the ones that we, the Intelligence Committee, pulled together a joint group between the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committee to be able to identify real reforms. This bill, the underlying bill, provides 55 reforms, both to the FISA court process, to the FBI's processes, and to the use and the collection of 702 data that go right to the heart of the actual abuses. They're not stabs into the dark, they are actual definitional responses to each of the abuses that we found. Now, the chair and ranking member of the Judiciary Committee unfortunately want to, to debate an amendment that's coming up rather than the solutions that we provided, and I want to first focus on those solutions. Together, the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committee came up with 55 recommendations that reform the FBI querying process, basically taking it out of the hands of the rank and file of the FBI. We found that their abuses were so egregious that the FBI was broken and we had no ability to continue to trust the system, so we elevated and limited their use of a 702 FISA information. Uh, we made certain that the FISA court itself could not ever again be subject to the, the political abuses that occurred in the, in the Trump campaign. And in all of these, we went back and made criminal penalties for anyone who violates these new higher standards. We also gave um, specifically an opportunity for Congress in its oversight to increase its oversight of these so that we can ensure that the criminal prosecutions occur for those who might violate these provisions in the future. Now, um, the chair and ranking of judiciary are, are talking about imposing a warrant on the search of 702 information. And I want to make a few things clear. There is no warrantless searches of American citizens' data. That does not occur under FISA. It's not permissible under FISA. It's illegal. They don't even have the mechanism within which to do it. They, do, they survey foreigners located abroad and a limited subset. It's about 250,000 people. It is subject to court supervision, and, that, and the court supervision is determining that each of those individuals represents a national security threat, a foreigner abroad, national security threat to the United States. So what would their warrant requirement be then? If it's foreigners that are abroad, what would their requirement be? It would be to go in to the head of ISIS, to go into the head of Hamas's data, and look in that data that where Americans' names and American citizens who are communicating with Hamas and ISIS may be. It's not going into Americans' data. There is, there is no warrantless spying on Americans under 702 or FISA. There is no ability to go into American data under this law, except with a warrant. They're already under the law is a requirement that if you're going to go into Americans' data, 
that you must get a warrant. The requirement that they're asking for is a warrant if you go into Hamas's data and look at, at Americans that are corresponding with Hamas, or if you go into ISIS data and look at ISIS data for Americans that are corresponding with ISIS. Now, first off, there's no, there is no constitutional requirement for that. The courts have already ruled that you have no constitutional right to privacy as an American to, to correspond with an ISIS head who's a foreigner located abroad. That is not protected communication. Now, your communications remain protected. We can't go into your, um, into your communication, into your data without a warrant. But if you communicate with ISIS, the head of ISIS or the head of Hamas, you lose your constitutional protection under those communications. If we're spying on the head of Hamas, which you and Americans would want us to do, your communications are going to be caught up at the head of Hamas. To impose a warrant requirement is dangerous for America. The Wall Street Journal stated, Section 702 lets the government monitor non-U.S. citizens outside the United States to protect national security. Don't let anybody tell you this is a warrantless program surveying Americans. The House Judicial Com Judiciary Committee has gone the wrong way. The legislation that could end up that could end Section 702 uh, would make it useless as a national security tool. The bill would require their amendment, a warrant for queries of U.S. persons even though the information is already collected. In other words, what the, what, what the Wall Street Journal is, is indicating is if you collect Hamas's data, you shouldn't need a warrant to look at Hamas's data, even if an American is in there. If an American is communicating with Hamas, it's a national security threat. We should not have a warrant. It will shut down our ability to be effective. I yield back. Thank you very much. Now I'll turn to my good friend, the distinguished ranking member of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Himes. Uh, you're recognized for any opening statement you care to make. Thank you, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member McGovern for the opportunity to speak about the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act of 2024. I'm going to state something that hasn't been stated, but it's critical. Section 702 is our single most important intelligence collection authority, bar none, full stop. Almost 60 percent of the articles in the President's daily brief have or contain information from the 702 collection program. And the intelligence community uses this program every single day to keep Americans safe. For more than a year, the intelligence committee has worked diligently and collaboratively to reauthorize Section 702, starting from the premise that it is essential that we reauthorize it, but that we cannot and will not do so without very strong reforms. All members of the intelligence committee have been deeply engaged in that effort. We have hosted briefings, both classified and unclassified, for members and staff to educate the staff on the complexities of Section 702. HIPSI's oversight demonstrated the value of Section 702, but it also found, as my colleagues have said, genuine problems in how Section 702 has been used and room for important reforms. Those problems are primarily within the FBI, where the Bureau for many years demonstrated an unacceptable record on compliance with the standards for querying U.S. persons. Thankfully, the robust systems of audit and oversight of Section, 02, Section 702 that Congress has previously put in place identified those shortcomings, and we are now in a position to take corrective action. I would also point out, as I believe the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee said, that uh, internal changes inside the FBI have already dramatically improved, both reduced the number of U.S. person queries by 90 percent, and we're at a point now where less than 1 percent of FBI queries are noncompliant. The bill before the Rules Committee today includes many of the extensive reforms that the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Oversight efforts identified. The more than 50 reforms are aimed directly at the problems that have arisen while ensuring that this authority can continue to keep Americans safe. In the interest of time, I won't describe all of the reforms contained in the base text, but I will just mention a few. The bill would institute a flat prohibition on queries conducted by the FBI to uncover, quote, evidence of a crime. A flat ban on all queries for evidence of a crime will help drive compliance and make clear that this is an intelligence tool, not a law enforcement tool. This bill would also reduce by 90 percent the number of individuals at the FBI who can approve a U.S. person query. This will reduce compliance failures and ensure that every time the FBI queries the FISA 702 data, it does so for a permissible purpose. And finally, this bill includes important reforms to the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, most notably by requiring that the FISC appoint an amicus to represent the privacy rights of Americans each time the government seeks to renew its annual certification under 702. 
These are tough reforms that go well beyond what the administration was seeking, but they preserve the fundamental value of the program to protect American lives while balancing critical privacy rights. As everyone has mentioned, we will also debate multiple amendments. I plan to support some of those and oppose others. I expect the House will debate an amendment to apply a probable cause warrant, as we have heard uh, earlier, when the FBI or the IC searches lawfully collected 702 data using a, person, a U.S. person identifier. With great respect to my judiciary colleagues, this proposal is seriously misguided and would effectively ban U.S. person queries in nearly every instance. Let's be clear about something. FISA 702 has been re-annually certified every single year since 2009. The certification process involves presenting the 702 program to federal judges who then issue a certification every single year. In not one of those years between 2009 and the present have federal judges say that there is that, that the querying of, the U, of, of U.S. persons in the database raises unreasonable search and seizure issues. Not once. No federal court has said that there is a constitutional violation here. So you may be uncomfortable with U.S. person queries, but you can't clothe that discomfort in constitutional concerns. I'll note that if I can just take a half a minute here, the reason the FBI does many of these queries is defensive. That is to say, a member of Congress is being discussed by Chinese intelligence officers. There's no real worry that the member of Congress is engaged in a crime, but obviously our intelligence community would like to know why Chinese intelligence officers are talking about a member of Congress, and they would query it accordingly. There is no way you can make a defensive query uh, if you can't tell, tell a judge that you believe you'll turn up evidence of a crime. I would also sort of hark back to an analogy around 9-11. On 9-11, the failure was associated by the inability of intelligence and law enforcement to talk to each other. So as Chairman Turner said, if we pick up that an ISIS leader is talking to an individual in Los Angeles who is by definition a U.S. person, we have no idea why that conversation is occurring. It could be a family member or a friend. So you cannot go to a judge and say, we have no idea why this communication is occurring, but we want you to issue us a probable cause warrant. That is why the administration says that the passage of a warrant requirement would shut this program down. I'll just note that every ranking member that touches either foreign policy or national security, myself, ranking member Meeks, ranking member Smith, ranking member Thompson, former Speaker Pelosi, former Majority Leader Hoyer, will vote against this amendment. The amendment also goes a lot further than the PCLOB, the President's Civil Liberty uh, Oversight Board recommended. They recommended a much, much more narrowly tailored amendment, and yet this Judiciary Amendment goes way beyond what the PCLOB recommended. It goes way beyond what Senator Durbin has recommended. So, while the sentiment is one that perhaps I understand, this is an extreme amendment, and I hope it is voted down. Uh, once again, I want to thank Chairman Turner for his leadership on the bill and the leadership of the Judiciary Committee. And I also want to note my appreciation to both committees for working so hard on this. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, just in the interest of time, the chair will at least for now forego questions. So turn to my good friend from Minnesota for any questions she may have for our panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just have a, a real, well, maybe quick, um, <laughs> but for uh, Chairman Turner and Chairman Jordan, uh, you know, can you discuss how the uh, this is the appropriate balance between empowering law enforcement and respecting civil rights or liberties? <clears throat> this is a really good opportunity for us, I think, to get an agreement from everybody who's here, right? Because. Because one of the issues that we always have whenever we're discussing FISA is it gets so confusing of the fact that we're only talking about one foreign intelligence tool. I mean, there are all types of other issues that judiciary has to deal with and we have to deal with. But I, I think, first off, before we go forward, we should probably get an agreement between the four of us so that at least the Rules Committee has an understanding that we're, we're all talking about the same thing. 702 is foreign surveillance of foreigners abroad. <coughs> can, can we have universal agreement between the four of us? Because it is what the law states. It is, and I have it in front of me. It limits. It is surveillance of foreigners abroad. Uh, Frank, you remember now there's a group. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, is the witness supposed to direct his 
the comments to us or to the other witnesses? Well, actually, you're correct. You should address your comments, we're, please. Well, we're, we're a team, so I'm making certain that I consult with our team as we give the answer. For the record, everyone has agreed, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, my Ranking Member, myself, in my framing your answer, <clears throat> that we're talking about foreign surveillance of foreigners located abroad. Um, what we found in this um, uh, in this process of 702, because there's two really big provisions we're dealing with. We're dealing with 702, and we're dealing with the, the court itself. They are they are separate. Under 702, what we found is that the FBI had an unbelievable number of abuses where they were <coughs> routinely looking at this the data of foreigners located abroad, searching it for Americans' data, and what they whether or not Americans were located in that. What they found is their computer system was set up so it did it automatically. Um, they, they didn't have any criteria for determining whether or not Tom Cole was searched as to whether or not he was communicating with, with ISIS um, in, in any of their processes. They in he is not. <laughs> they changed those processes upon our uh, uh, raising these issues with them, where it says, uh, Jim said it was like 280,000 times that they, in a year, that they were violating that. That they reduced those down to 680. And what you'd find is that when they were <coughs> searching Hamas's data and ISIS data for unrelated Americans, 98% of the queries returned zero information because the information, those individuals, we're not corresponding with the, the 250,000 people that we consider some of our most national sec security uh, threats or, or issues. What we've done. So what we've done in this, though, is that we've limited the number of people who can do it. So we've, we've made the standards higher, the professionalism and training higher, and then we've put on it real uh, consequences, uh, real criminal uh, prosecutions for, uh, for uh, intentional violations and for those who uh, use this information inappropriately on the court side, we really nailed it down. Uh, we made it certain that um, uh, information and data was not admissible before court. If someone did so that was used against the Trump administration, if someone did so, they had criminal prosecution. Uh, we um, made certain that if it's a U.S. person, that an, in, that an independent attorney is appointed and is part of the process to be a counter to um, ensure that the laws are followed. And we also um, made certain that there, is, that there is a hearing and a transcript, and that that data is made available if there should be subsequent um, uh, uh, pers legal proceedings so that the American citizen would have ac access to it and be able to challenge it. Uh, I would just respond by saying we have no problem with surveilling foreigners. It's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance mm -hmm. Act, as, as, the ranking, or as the chairman just said. What we have a concern about is a term that Ranking Member Himes, I think, used four times in his presentation, U.S. person queries. And that's a fancy way of saying U.S. person searches. They are searching Americans. So that is our concern. And we know, we know, not according to Jerry Nadler and Jim Jordan, but according to the Washington Post and information we've, we've, uh, we've received from the Inspector General and others, the FBI, this is quoting straight from Mr. Barrett's piece a year ago, the FBI has misused a powerful digital surveillance tool more than 278,000 times, including against crime victims, January 6 riot suspects, people arrested at protests in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd in 2020, and in one case, as the ranking member referenced, 19,000 donors to a congressional candidate, according to a newly unsealed court document. That has nothing to do with Hamas or Hezbollah. That's U.S. person searches, not queries, searches of their information. And the, the, the author goes on to say, the failure to use this 702 database correctly when collecting information about U.S. citizens and others make it harder for the agency to marshal support for Congress to renew the law. That's why we're saying information picked up in this, what is becoming a bigger and bigger haystack of information, information about American citizens, U.S. persons in there, if you're going to query that. You're going to use a phone number, an email, or a name, as the ranking member said. You should go get a warrant to do that. That, that is the crux of the matter. Of course we want to, bad guys overseas, of course you want to surveil them. But we're not talking about, we're talking about the term that Mr. Himes, again, used several times in his opening statement, U.S. persons. This is why this is so important that we had the, the agreement before I started answering your question. Yes. 
because what Jim said is absolutely right. I mean, the abuses were horrific. I mean, the whole fact that people who were arrested in, in, during the George, George Floyd riots yeah. had their names searched in Hamas's data is an absolute violation. Now, in, under 702, the people who were arrested for protesting for George Floyd, under 702, they didn't go search their data. They went and searched Hamas's data and ISIS data. The problem is, is that, that Jim and, and Ranking Member Nadler want to have a warrant to search Hamas's data and ISIS's data. There's already a warrant requirement to go and search an American's data, to go and search their data. But if you're going to go look in Hamas or ISIS, and you're an American citizen that's corresponded with ISIS or Hamas, there should not be a warrant to look at that data. With all due respect, I think the, uh, the chairman misunderstands the bill or, or the situation. Of course you don't need a warrant to surveil Hamas. No one claims you do. But when it comes to surveilling an American person, a U.S. person, like any other situation, you should need a warrant. That, that is yes. the law. It is not the law. It, it is absolutely well, the law. Well, it is the law. I mean, right now, under the law, if you, have to, if you are going to surveil case, an American citizen, you need a warrant. In it's only case. if you're searching Hamas's data or ISIS data that you don't need a warrant, and that's what you want to put a, da well, a warrant on. And, and I think the American citizens believe that if somebody is corresponding with Hamas and ISIS, for example, if they send them an email that says, thanks for the bomb-making classes, we ought not get, have to get a warrant to look in Hamas's data that we have to find out that they thanked them but for bomb-making well, classes. We, again, if you want to search Hamas, that's fine, and no one claims you need a warrant. If you want to search a U.S. person, you should need a warrant. Now, you say we do already. Right, right. But uh, let me finish. Okay, so you say we do. If we do, then the amendment that the Judiciary Committee proposes requiring such a warrant should not be objectionable no, to no, you. That's not what your warrant says. So let's go over it, because I mean, I, we have it, and I think certainly for the Rules Committee, people have to vote. I mean, if, if, you're, if there's confusion among the four of us as to what your amendment does, and we need to clear it up. Your amendment says that there would be a warrant required to look in 702 data, which is foreigners located abroad's data, the 250,000 that we identify as the most national security threat, there's an American who has communicated with them. No, That's you, what your amendment no, that no, says. You, mis you misunderstand the amendment. What the amendment says is that if Hamas, whom we are properly surveilling, or any other people for that matter, the Chinese communists, whoever we're, we're, we're surveilling abroad, we find that they communicate with an American. Now, we have the metadata. But under your amendment, you can Let Mr. Sorry. Nadler, uh, I'd like to hear what yeah. he's having Sorry. to say. Well, I'm just going to remind our witnesses, please don't talk to one another, talk to the panel. We and please don't talk over one another. Yeah. It's very we difficult. We have the metadata. That is to say, the name and phone number, or presumably the phone number, <laughs> of the American person that Hamas, or whoever, uh, abroad, called. If we want to know, however, what if we want to surveil all the phone records of that American person, like any other search, you ought to need a warrant. That's current law. It is not current law. If it is current law, then the amendment that we have here saying that a probable cause warrant to conduct a U.S. person search of the 702 database with limited exceptions for exigency, cybersecurity, and victim consent should not be objectionable. No, no, no. And, you and, just and, said. Excuse me. Um, Sorry. I, I Again, I asked you not to interrupt one another, not to talk to one another, answer the gentlelady's question. And, and I was going to ask Chairman Jordan because I, I was curious. If, if there was some uh, another answer in between, <laughs> okay. I, I agree, but I agree with uh, Ranking Member Nadler. It's why we put the amendment. And understand, we have exceptions in the amendment. Ms. Ms. Yep. To say if it's an emergency situation, and you think the time element or whatever time element that is, even though it's constitutional, there's an emergency situation, or if there's a permission. The example that I think the Ranking Member of the Intelligence Committee gave 
if a member, of, if, if two people in China are talking about a member of Congress, go talk to that member of Congress and say, hey, do you care, do you care if we query this database? Because we think these guys are trying to target you in some way. Of course, that individual, that member of Congress, would go ahead, figure it out. We want to know what the Chinese are trying to do to a member of Congress. And then the third one is if it's a known, known cybersecurity threat, some known malware that's been used, that's an exception as well. So we tried to structure this, this warrant requirement with some exceptions, which, so frankly, we're giving on the side of, of the Judiciary Committee in the way we structured this because we get this national security issue, but we also get the Constitution. And we also get this fundamental principle that it's a separate and equal, we have separate and equal branches of government to put a check. You don't want the executive branch being able to just not follow the rules or the rules that are in place, they get to do their own thing. That's why we have a separate and equal branch that has to okay it when you're going to go get information about an American citizen. I, I will just say thank you very much and I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank the General Lady. I now turn to my good friend, the distinguished ranking member, for any questions he has. Yeah, just, just, just briefly, I mean, this is all a fascinating discussion. It's clear that you don't agree with each other. So, um, we agree. no, you guys agree. You know, <laughs> the, 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 I guess my, my, here, here, let me just cut, kind of cut to the chase. Um, you know, uh, this is the third time we're, we're up here. Um, uh, I mean, on the Intelligence Committee, I mean, do you object? to having the Rules Committee make and order the uh, warrant amendment? No, we, we do not. Uh, okay. but, we, we, and we, we, but we do think that the debate needs to be clear as I, to I, what I, I the warrant that. requires, and, and I glorious, encourage everyone to read it. But it, so if the Rules Committee makes that amendment in order, you're okay with it, right? And if the Rules Committee doesn't make it in order, I don't know how the rule passes. That's, that's your guys' concern. All right, well, concern, so if, it's, I, I if, it's gonna be, if, if we're all in agreement that it should be made in order, hopefully it be made in order, and we can debate this on the floor. Yep. Right? Well said. Okay, I, I, have no, do we, I have no questions. Thank you. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for any questions you may have for the panel. Let's see. Um, Mr. Jordan was, uh, sorry, Chairman Jordan, was the 702 FISA program used to spy on a presidential candidate or, or his campaign? I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. What I do know is that's, that's the other part of FISA, the FISA court. That process was abused, and there's some, some measures in here to try to uh, alleviate that, but I don't know. So, was, so the FISA court, though, the FISA program, not 702, but right. some part of the program was used to spy on a presidential campaign? Yep. Is that, is that true? So, there, it, so there, there are no allegations that 702 was used to spy on President Trump's campaign. The provisions of the FISA court that we have reforms for that actually their amendment does not relate to um, would prevent the types of abuses that, uh, that resulted in Carter Page having warrants issued against him. And was that done illegally? <clears throat> I believe that they defrauded the court. The, the, the actual review of it has not resulted in anyone being found to have, um, uh, to have defrauded the court. What we have done in the reforms, which again, their amendment does not relate to or touch the FISA court or the Carter Page issue or the Trump issue, our amendments tighten up the operations of the court so that this can never happen again. We exclude from evidence uh, any political opposition research. We exclude from evidence any um, news articles. We appoint an attorney for any U.S. persons that goes be that where a warrant application is before the court to review the application and advise the court. Uh, we require uh, that every person that submit information as part of the investigation process um, certify under oath the material that they're providing to the court so that they're subject to both pe perjury penalties and also criminal uh, prosecutions for defrauding the court. What we did is we went back and every place where we believe that they had violated the, the um, Carter Page's rights or the court processes, um, we put a reform in place. And again, their amendment um, doesn't ad address that. We're all in agreement that these amendments that we have in place on, on the FISA court are important. Mr. Jordan. I was just going to add one thing. There, there was one individual found guilty of, of uh, lying to the court. Kevin Kleinsmith was found guilty of that in that whole process. So there was someone who was held to account. Not, not nearly enough in my judgment, but there was one. That, that's actually the, 
the question I was asking. So was somebody found guilty of abusing the FISA program to spy on a, a presidential campaign? Well, Chairman really, Turner. Chairman Turner. Yeah, Kevin right. Kleinsmith was. Yeah, I'm asking Chairman Turner. Right, so there, there were, it was found in the, the, um, uh, in the process that there was an individual that actually um, um, modified an email and submitted it through the process. Now, under our amendments, that individual would have much more severe consequences, and they'd be found of both defrauding the court and perjury um, and um, uh, providing falsified evidence. Uh, so we have, we have made it now uh, that uh, as, as a significant deterrent factor so that anyone who is found to have done what he did or any of the other processes of individuals who were found that were not uh, prosecuted uh, would be prosecuted. But there was somebody found guilty of abusing the FISA program to spy on presidential campaign. It was an individual that was found to have modified, to submitted falsified evidence, which is different than the entire process that, that we right. identified like and 10 things that we believe that were violated, and we, we provide amendments to reform that process. So we somebody- We're in agreement of these amendments. Right. Somebody broke the law to use the FISA program to spy on a presidential campaign. Is that correct? I, I, we're all in agreement on that. Mr. Hans. Did somebody break the law to abuse the FISA program to spy on President Trump's campaign? My understanding is the same as Chairman Turner's and Chairman Jordan's, which is that there was an individual who was uh, prosecuted for some process failure in applying for an affidavit under Title I of FISA, which is distinct from 702. Distinct from 702, but this is, this is not some right-wing conspiracy. I just want to get this out there. There was somebody in the government who abused the FISA program to spy on Donald Trump's campaign, and they've been uh, found guilty of falsifying information. Is that correct, Mr. Himes? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, Mr. Turner, Chairman Turner, you said there are 250,000 targets overseas, and you characterize oh, them. About. Okay, roughly. And you characterize them as heads of Hamas and heads of ISIS. Wouldn't there be other people as well? Could there, in fact, be people in Germany who are staffing the, the heads of state there? Or could there be, is there anything to prevent, for instance, members of parliament from being uh, among those 250,000? The category, which is a, a process that by which the intelligence community goes to the, the FISA court and has the the, uh, the individuals who are subject to uh, surveillance reviewed, includes categories that that also relate to uh, national security threats, foreign intelligence uh, threats, and um, and so there are broader individuals. There are not, as I was indicating, we don't look at Paul McCartney. Uh, we don't. We don't look at uh, you know the head of Airbus. Um, we look at only those issues uh, that are related to national security. National security threat. Mr. Massey, can I? Get yes, you? Mr. Nadler. Foreign foreigners do not have constitutional rights. Americans have constitutional rights, which is why we need the uh, fourth the, the, the search the uh, search amendment. Um, if the intelligence community thinks that a member of parliament or a staff member of the uh, German chancellor is spying for uh, Putin or, or the Chinese communists, they can certainly surveil that person. And they may find that it's true or it may not. They can surveil anybody who is not an American citizen um, without, uh, under, under FISA. And there's no, nothing to stop them and there's no reason they should be stopped. Mr. Turner, so let me ask this again. Um, could, a, could a member of parliament in Germany or one of the um, executive branch bureaucrats in Germany be targeted under the FISA no, 702 program? Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Himes. Let me just make this point because it hasn't come out. The roughly 250,000 foreign targets must fall into one of several categories. They are counterproliferation, counterterrorism, foreign intelligence activities. If an individual doesn't fall into that category of suspicion, they could not be added to the target list. So 
it's important that we understand that, that there is a, a uh, filter that targets must pass through that indicates that they may be involved, they might be a foreign intelligence officer involving in proliferation or terrorism in order to get on that target list. So no, the government can't simply pick uh, uh, a minister of parliament in the UK or in Germany and put them on the list without a justification in one of those categories. Well, seem, they've got 250,000 people. I just find it hard to believe there's that many heads of Hamas and heads of ISIS. Could a business person end up on this list for traveling to, let's say, Russia uh, to work on some business deals in, in Moscow? Well, to be clear, Mr. Massey, between Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, you probably have hundreds of thousands of intelligence officers who would be legitimate targets under the foreign officer of an intelligence service. Uh, a business person, just to, ask, to answer your question, could only be put under the target list if they were suspected of being involved in terrorism, proliferation, or a foreign intelligence officer. Go ahead, Chairman so, Turner. Um, one of the things that's difficult in, in all of these discussions is that, you know, obviously there are a number of different intelligence programs and intelligence, intelligence gathering arms of, of, of the United States government. We're dealing with 702. Um, 702 is foreigners located abroad of which there's national security interest. What you just described, uh, for example, right now Russia is subject to um, uh, sanctions, and uh, if there is an individual who is a, an American who is currently violating those sanctions, um, they could be subject to uh, being caught up in surveillance of that Russian that they're doing business with because they're violating the law. That's not that's not 702. Seven, we are, we don't do sanction um, uh, enforcement um, under under 702. So, um, so let's say, I'll just pick a name, Mary Catherine sends 10,000 emails. She's an American, never been abroad, always lived in the United States. She sends 10,000 emails in a year, 2, 000, makes 2,000 phone calls, 5,000 texts, 500 direct messages uh, on her social media uh, platform. And let's, see, let's say 0.1% of those are caught up in the FISA 702 program. Why wouldn't you need a warrant to go after those emails that are in the FISA program that, that were ostensibly collected in pursuit of a foreign agent? Why does Mary Catherine only have protection over some of her communications? Well, it's the same as if you and I communicate. I mean, if, if I send an email to you um, and it's then in your data, it's not, it's not my data. But, but what's the principle that requires you to get a warrant to search you know, all of that stuff, but not some of that stuff. Well, again, it's not that stuff. It's because we're not searching Mary Catherine. If to search Mary's her, material, to search Mary's material, you would need a warrant, and you would need a warrant <coughs> based upon probable cause, and that is, as I was saying to the ranking member, current law. Now, for those that she sends to individuals that are subject to surveillance, if she sends one to Vladimir Putin and it ends up in Vladimir Putin's data, again, I send an email to you, I'm in your data, that's no longer my data, um, you don't need a warrant if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's just because Mary sent an email to Vladimir Putin. Now, if you wanted to go look at Mary's data under current law, and there's been no allegation in any 702 uh, of the abuses that we're remedying here, that, that Mary's dad is searched without a warrant. It's Vladimir Putin's that's searched without a warrant, and if Mary's in there, then, then that's Vladimir's data, not Mary's. I like that you keep going back to Vladimir Putin and the heads of Hamas now that we've established that members of the German parliament or uh, bureaucrats within the German government could be part of this. And my point is this, if Mary Catherine has 20,000 communications and she's a red-blooded American, and a hundred of them get swept up in your program, then why doesn't she get her constitutional rights for those 100? Why would you deprive her? The, the, I'm not saying they're going to Putin or the head of Hamas. Mary Catherine has no interest in communicating with them. Somehow one of them goes to somebody in Germany that's on your list that has no constitutional rights. Why does she give up her constitutional rights 
just because she's communicating with somebody who has no constitutional rights. She hasn't surrendered her constitutional rights. Again, back to... You're surrendering I, her constitutional I, rights under this program. I, let's say I email you, and let's say you're subject to a warrant, and they take your phone, which has happened to other members of Congress, and my, and my email is in your phone. They don't need a warrant separately to read my email to you if they have a warrant for your phone. This is a probable cause warrant, which is what they were calling for. If, if your data is lawfully taken, then there's no requirement to look at my data in yours uh, with a separate warrant. You don't have to get a separate warrant to look at everybody's information that's in somebody's data if you have a warrant to look at theirs. In this program, if we have the ability to, to survey, and everyone in the entire country would want us to, Vladimir Putin, if you email Vladimir Putin, you don't have constitutional protections of that email to Vladimir Putin. You do have all of your other emails. To go look in your data, you would have to have a probable cause warrant that shows that somehow you violated the laws. And by, by the way, there's no law that you violated in corresponding with Vladimir Putin. If you sent him an email, though, that did in indicate that you were like a gun runner or doing something that was illegal, then, and only then, then the government would still have to go to court to look at your data. They can't just go and look at you, follow through and take your data. Let me, let me see if I understand the legal principle here. Americans have constitutional rights to privacy except for when they're communicating with somebody who doesn't have a constitutional right to privacy. If they are communicating with foreigners located abroad for which that foreigner does not have constitutional rights to their data, we do not apply the United States Constitution to foreigners located abroad. A small subset of foreigners located abroad, those which rise to the level of being a national security threat, we do spy on. The, the American public would want us to spy on individuals that, that are a threat to our country. If you communicate with one of those individuals, yes, your emails, your data that are in that individual, the head of ISIS, the head of Hamas, Vladimir Putin, um, are subject to, to intercept. And, they, and courts have ruled, regardless of what this law says, uh, courts have ruled are not subject to any additional protection. Your data remains protected, but not those that you've communicated to a foreigner abroad. Mr. Nadler. I think, yes, Mr. Ch Ranking Member Nadler. Thank you. Um, if, a foreign, if, 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 you, if, a, if you're communicating with a foreigner and for some reason this foreigner is, is being surveilled by, by the United States, they will catch your communication. They know what you said. Presumably, they're wiretapping it. They know what you said to the foreigner. They know what the foreigner said to you. Fine. But if they now want to look at, because you're communicating with Vladimir Putin, they suspect, even though all you said to him was uh, happy birthday. But since you're communicating with him, they suspect that maybe you're up to no good. And they want to search all your communications. They need a warrant. You should need a warrant. And that's what our What's amendment says. Right. Under current FISA law, you would not need a warrant. Under the bill in, in chief, you would not need a warrant. And that's why we are putting in a probable cause uh, amendment, a, a probable cause warrant amendment, which we hope will be made in order. Mr. Matthew, if I could just go ahead. For one moment. Um, that, that, um, it, is not, it is not accurate. Uh, there, the current law, not this amendment, requires that if any, if the government is going to go look at an American's data or information, that a probable cause warrant is required. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, um, it is not accurate to say that the government can, can do so. And I'm going to read into the record their actual amendment, because their amendment does not say if they go to look at Americans' data. Their amendment says, except as provided in some paragraphs B and C, no <laughs> officer or employee of the United States may conduct a query of information acquired under this section, which is 702, for the purposes of finding communications or information, the compelled productions of which will require a probable cause warrant. It's a warrant to look at Hamas, ISIS, Vladimir Putin. Current law requires, even if the, without this amendment, current law requires to look at your data, Mary's data, or anyone else, that they get a warrant. 
I wouldn't want anyone to think otherwise. These are queries of the 702 database, which is why Mr. Turner is incorrect. How big is the 702 database, Mr. Chairman Turner? I, I, I can't tell you, obviously, the extent of which the database is. It is the data of foreigners located abroad, of which there are about 250,000 that are court supervised, that are identified as um, national security threats or national security intelligence uh, targets as a result of the, the um, threats and protection for the United States. Is some of that data collected uh, domestically because it goes through the U U.S. servers? Mr. Himes. Mr. Massey, if I may, <clears throat> the reason this program exists is because it is compelled process, that is to say, served to largely U.S. service providers. If we were simply pulling emails out of the air in a foreign country, no such, no such process would be required. But because process is being served to email providers, text providers, et cetera, that's why this program exists. And it's hard to answer your question about size, because for those roughly 250,000 targets, all of whom are foreigners, uh, some could be very prolific with their emails and their texts. But it's important to bound the number of Americans who are likely to have their information in the database. The only way a US person, an American, could have their information in this database is if they are communicating with one of these foreign targets. My guess would be that that's probably vanishingly small. I don't know how many people in this room are in regular email contact with Russian intelligence agents or members of Hamas, but it's probably vanishingly small. Now, if this were truly a constitutional issue, that argument would fail. But again, since you ask constitutional questions, Mr. Massey, I would say that since 2009, federal judges uh, appointed by presidents of all political stripes have at no point in time found a constitutional issues with a U.S. person query. So um, let's talk about the abuses. M Mr. Nadler, how many abuses, or Mr. Jordan, whoever wants to speak to this, did the, did the FBI or the IG admit that were going on? Well, it's been reported, it's been reported 278,000. 278,000. Is there, was there ever an instance of somebody, like what kind of abuses are there? Is there ever an instance of somebody going in looking for an ex-wife or a girlfriend or putting some search terms on somebody they're thinking about dating, for instance, or? Yeah, there, 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 ha there has been, uh, Mr. Massey, there has been that. And as I pointed out, there was a, one done to a congressional candidate uh, campaign. Uh, and of course, the best examples are, you know, in the, in the summer 2020, the, People in the BLM uh, protests and, and riots around the country. There was there was uh, queries done there. So, um, Mr. Mr. Turner, when somebody uses this program to go in and look for an ex-wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend information on them, do you, do you think they're going in there because they think their uh, wife may have talked with the head of Hamas? It seems to me like there'd be a lot more information in there. If they're interested in abusing the program, they're just not going to. They're not going to find out anything on somebody by looking into this database. If all it's got is interactions with villains, Mr. Massey, the the abuses were horrific, um, and as a result of the committee's work, I mean, here's here's your, here's the graph. By the way, here's what two hundred and seventy-eight thousand look like. The FBI, as a result of the intelligence community's oversight, instituted changes to their own procedures and limitations and also increased oversight, resulting in the number of, of these abuses dropping from 278,000 to 610. This is what the two bar charts look like. That's not enough. We need to make certain that the FBI has very limited access overall to this data as a result of the abuses themselves. That's why our uh, and their joint, you know, all four of us are before you in favor of the underlying bill. Uh, that's why our response is to punish both the FBI, restructure the FBI, limit the FBI's availability and access to address those abuses. Mr. Massey, yeah. let me uh, correct that. Uh, I believe Mr. Jordan and I and are only in favor of the underlying bill if the warrant requirement uh, amendment is adopted. Yep. Um, 
Mr. Turner, Chairman Turner, how many people have access to this database today? To run queries, searches on American. So the, the actual number, um, we're going to uh, give you an approximation is around 10,000. And what we're going to go to is uh, around 550 to give you a comparison. We are significantly restricting both the level of as to who has access and the number that has access and the review of those who access it. So 10,000 people had access to it, and you th does this have a number? Approximately. Um, so explain to me how you, you think the intelligence community wants to use this program. Is it Because I think I heard this before. They said if there, let's say there was a, a protest here at the Capitol, um, which it's legal to exercise your First Amendment rights, there, there's a protest here at the Capitol. Let's say they're uh, protesting um, the treatment of uh, Palestinians. Would, would uh, the intel community use that, uh, the fact that they showed up at a, at a protest of that nature to go into this uh, database and see if those people, had, as you said, took bomb-making lessons and sent an email saying thank you very much for the bomb-making lesson? Well, those are two different things. I mean, if someone sends a, an email to Hamas or ISIS and says, thank you for the bomb-making classes, and that email is found, to look further into that individual's data <clears throat> under the Constitution and-, and Right, that's not my question. Would require, that's what you we're said. Getting, no, 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 we're getting reward. far away from my question. It my question is, if somebody's uh, protesting the treatment of Palestinians here at the Capitol, would that- uh, That is not- just, does the what what does somebody need that has access to this database to go search? Do they need probable cause? So, Mr. Massey, but let, me, uh, let me let me ask Mr. Turner real quick. Now, I'll ask give you a chance to answer. Do they need probable? Yeah. Do they need probable cause to go looking in the 702 database, or would appearance at a protest be enough? No, appearance at a protest is not enough. So why not require probable cause? Probable cause for to go search in the 702 database. To uh, let me, I'm asking Mr. Turner. Thanks, Mr. Himes. I'll give you a chance to answer. Why not require probable cause to go into that database? The database on, for an, an American. Okay, are you going to stop answering your question so I can ask you your question so I can answer it? Are we are we finished? I, it, no, we, it, we don't have five minutes here. It, it I want to. We have plenty of time, so you take as much as you want. Great. My friend Chip Roy's coming from the airport. I'd be glad to let you have 30 minutes. Excellent. Your question, which I think is an important one, is if an American protests specifically the issue of treatment of Palestinians, is that sufficient? No. And in fact, as Chairman Jordan was saying, individuals who protest with respect to the treatment of George Floyd, that was insufficient, and those were deemed abusive. So why not require probable cause? That's my question, Mr. Turner. Right. So the, the issue of, of probable cause is that it's the, the, the data that is already collected on the individuals that are foreigners located abroad have no constitutional protection. The head of Hamas, the head of ISIS, Vladimir Putin has no constitutional protection. That data is validly collected data by the United States government. It is important intelligence information that is used to keep America safe. Searching that data does not require a warrant. Right. So but you have some prohibition on searching that data. I'm trying to understand why you have prohibitions, but then you don't want the Constitution to be a prohibition. Where does the Constitution get in your Constitution, way? The Constitution applies. And, and, and as I said, if you, in collecting foreigners' information abroad, find that there's communications of which you, you believe that there may be evidence that American is committing a crime, such as an email that says, thanks for the bomb-making classes. That requires, as you and I were discussing, 
that that email then be brought to court and go through a probable cause, full warrant hearing, to determine whether or not further information or data on an American citizen would be collected based upon a, pers uh, on a belief, probable cause based, determined by the court that they were committing a crime. Let me ask you differently. Under the framework you've established, somebody who shows up at a protest has an American who shows up at a protest in America, uh, you, you aren't constitutionally prohibited from going into the 702 database and searching for information on them. Is that correct? The 702 and FISA law is higher than the constitutional requirements. And in that law, we restrict the basis of searches and the, the basis upon which then that review occurs. And it's not my basis, it's the law that, is, that was previously established by Congress. Well, if 702 has stricter protocols than even the Constitution, then what's I the problem with yeah. using the Constitution I, in I this instance? Say stricter than the Constitution. You said higher requirements. I, the, the constitutional requirements on collecting data on foreigners abroad um, <clears throat> do not apply because they do not have constitutional rights. Yeah, I don't know why you're bringing that up. What I'm because asking that's you, the data. That's, what a, that's the data we're talking about. This law only applies, 702 only applies to data of foreigners located right. abroad. I'm not, I'm not saying you want to go collect more data on the protester. What I'm asking is, if somebody goes to a protest and they protest, is there, you're, uh, it's, I'm trying to understand, do you believe they have no constitutional uh, protections? No, I didn't say if that. You, I did let me that. finish my question. Do you believe they have no constitutional protections from you going in and searching the 702 database that already exists that was collected when targeting foreigners for, for information about them because they were at that protest? The the reason why FISA exists is to restrict government in areas where they're not restricted, which is searching, is, which is spying on foreigners located abroad. That's why this law exists. It, it exists so that we can restrict what the intelligence community's activities are. That's why we put it in place as Congress, well before I was here, well before you were here. We put it in place to govern and provide oversight of the intelligence community's collections of foreigners located abroad, and to put to impose upon it a court review process that was not constitutionally required, and that is the FISA court. Well, it, uh, I believe it enables, instead of just restricting, otherwise they wouldn't be so panicked that it's gonna expire. These aren't a list of restrictions, these are lists of authorities. It is both. It has both the authorization and the restriction. Well, I'll ask you one more time, then I'll go to the other witnesses, um, and then maybe I'll come back to you. So do you believe that somebody who shows up at a protest here in the United States, American citizen, uh, that they have constitutional protections that prevent members of the intelligence community from going into the previously collected 702 database and searching for their name? I believe that under the FISA Act in 702, and, and I, it expressly provides uh, provisions, that it is impermissible to go into the foreign information that's collected on foreigners abroad under this act for individuals who are protesting, and I agree with that outcome, which is why Chairman Jordan and myself both agree that it's an abuse, and it was found to be an abuse, for individuals who are protesting George Floyd to have their, um, their information queried in the 702 database. So it, within that, Mr. Massey, you and I agree. Well, here's what I don't agree. I don't agree that we should do that out of the kindness of our heart or the generosity that we're so benevolent, we're gonna let them have some rights. The, I believe that the Constitution requires, if you go express your First Amendment right, that doesn't put you on a list that then you could go be searched in some database, regardless of how it's collected. 
I don't care if it's collected with a Ouija board. Well, I, I, with the manner in which you just made that statement, I <laughs> absolutely agree with you. So why not have a warrant requirement if, you, if somebody shows up at a protest and a member of the intelligence community wants to search for that person in the 702 database, why not have a warrant requirement? And I'll, I'll let my ranking member answer as you indicate. There currently, that is an abuse. Under current law, that is a violation. You cannot just do a query based upon the fact that- So when that's happened, did anybody go to jail? That, that is exactly what our reforms are making. But if it's current law, why do you need to reform it? It is current law as it is an impermissible search. Our reforms, based upon what we've seen in abuses, what we all before you said, and I began with, we're here because the intelligence community has abused this process, is to make it both um, more restrictive and so that it would be, there would be real teeth, including criminal prosecutions for people who violate them. So why don't we just use the Constitution instead of coming up with a list that the Intel Committee tells you is a good list of, of things we should, uh, we, ways we should protect people? This program has already been before the, uh, the courts and found to be a constitutional program because it is about collecting foreigners' data abroad. <coughs> Mr. Jordan, Chairman well, I Jordan. Think, I, think, I think you've hit on it, uh, Mr. Massey. We know U.S. person queries are happening. We know that process, Mr. Himes used it several times, that term itself. And so U.S. persons are being searched. We know it was abused 278,000 times. And you're asking the question, what is the standard for conducting that search, for, conducting that, for doing that query? And the standard always used to be, it's an American citizen, probable cause, you got to get a warrant. And now it's something different. And I kind of like to know what that overall number is, how many, Ameri how many U.S. searches are done, and what is the standard for, for doing the search of the U.S. person. I think you've hit it exactly. And that's why we're saying let's go with the standard, the tried and true standard that's been around since this great country, the greatest country ever has been formed. Let's get a warrant. So one of, one of the reasons that I've heard of why we can't have a warrant requirement is it's clumsy. That uh, and that facilities don't exist for the FISA judges to rev review warrants. So the FISA judges, as I understand it, we met one in a skiff. They are federal judges who come uh, to the FISA court not all the time. They still hear cases back in their districts or circuits. They're federal judges who come and serve as FISA judges. And that uh, one of the arguments that I heard was that they don't have secure facilities in the locations where they're, where they're normally. Is that true, Chairman Turner? Um, I'm having my staff hand me the, the, the paper you, that you've reviewed um, that includes the information, <clears throat> the um, assessment. And you are right. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had for four hours uh, the opportunity to have, including a former FISA judge um, in a classified setting, to describe how this process works and the importance of being able to surveil foreigners located abroad, which again, this program is limited to foreigners located abroad. The information and data is that if there is a, um, if there was a judicial review required to search for Americans that have communicated with foreign targets abroad, for example, the chairman of the, the head of ISIS, the, uh, the head of, um, of Hamas, that it would take um, about 2,000 additional judges. You would, you would hire, I mean, in the Not case would, of- It would require the, the process to search the data that the United States collects on foreigners located abroad, head of Hamas, head of ISIS, Vladimir Putin, um, it would take to search that, to, to every time you search that data that was collected lawfully, that it would take an additional 2,000 judges, which is what the question that you had asked. Here's, here's uh, explain this math to me. So you're going to limit it to 500 people to access the database, but you're going to need 2,000 judges to review what 500 people are doing when they're poking in that database for Americans. That is the assessment, and you, you heard from the, um, the FISA court judge, as I did. Um, you and I were in the same briefing. But the numbers don't add up. 
Why would you need 2,000 new judges to review what 500 people are doing when they're accessing this database? Again, you and I received if you, it, I, I don't have a, I don't have an additional answer to you beyond the well, Mike, that, that you. The question I was going to ask is, um, which I did ask was, does it require, do these judges need SCIFs? Do they need secure areas to review these warrants? Uh, not how many judges there would be. I'm, I'm sorry, I was let me Let me, let me just start where I think we're going to end up. The, uh, I've heard as an excuse, other uh, members of our leadership have told me, oh, well, we can't do this. You can't require a warrant to go look in this database on Americans because these judges don't have skiffs where they live. They don't have the secure area to review the warrants. And I find that argument really hard to believe. We just spent $200 million on a new FBI building here. And you're telling me we can't build a, a little closet where the phone conversation can be secure when you call a judge to do a warrant. So I hope we don't hear that argument anymore unless you want to add some weight to it. I, you heard the same thing I did at the same meeting. I, okay. Yeah. Chair, Ranking Member Nadler. Um, the fact is, obviously, you can have a skiff in every federal courthouse in the country, and it wouldn't cost very much money. Um, so that is hardly an objection. And what we're talking about with this amendment, with the warrant requirement amendment, is that if you're going to search the phone records of an American citizen because his name uh, or, or his phone call was in someone you were uh, surveilling abroad, and it may be entirely innocent, but to, you have to have be able to prove probable cause why you believe that American citizen or that American person is doing something wrong. And that's the purpose of, her, of, 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 of the Fourth Amendment. And that's why we need this warrant requirement that's in this bill, because under the FISA court now, they're surveilling everybody, they're surveilling Americans without probable cause. And that's why we have this amendment. So my next question is, uh, Chairman Turner, is it true there's an exception in this bill for members of Congress? So there is a section, there are actually several sections that came about as a result of the Donald Trump abuses that relate to political abuses of the process. There are not exceptions, there are notification requirements with respect to Congress, both if there's an individual that is significant to a, um, a political campaign, including a presidential campaign, some of those are, are, are processes that we're putting in place now, um, and some relate to the court itself. Because of the concern of what came out of the, the Donald Trump uh, campaign abuses, those notifications would give us the ability to, to ferret out political biases. Was, was your member, was a member of your committee somehow involved in a uh, inappropriate FISA targeting or search? Yes. Uh, and so is that why you created an exception for members of Congress? or special treatment for members of Congress? I don't want to call it an exception. Yeah, there is, there is an exception. There's a notification requirement. Um, and um, the uh, Darren LaHood uh, made public uh, that he had been subject to inappropriate query. Uh, he was part of the process for drafting uh, these reforms. And, um, and absolutely, even though he was subject to an inappropriate query, um, is is adamantly opposed to the application of a warrant to search um, foreigners' data, such as we've been describing. Well, of course, he wouldn't have any objection to it now that he's got an exception. No, there's no exception. Well, now that he's gets special notification, that there's there's no exception. Is there a notification? There's a notification to Congress, so, so that we have the ability to oversight. So, oversight. wouldn't it? Uh, why wouldn't every American get a notification? It, it's not a notification to the individual. It's a notification to Congress for our ability for oversight for political bias arising out of the Donald Trump case. 
what allowed them in part to do the Donald Trump abuses, which again were, were seeking a probable cause warrant, was the fact that they had secrecy and we didn't have the ability to have oversight. We want the ability to have oversight when we believe there's political bias. I just, I think the American people would be a little concerned if they knew that there was a notification exception for a member of Congress that didn't apply to regular citizens. It is notification to Congress, not to the individual. Well, why not notify you if uh, um, somebody's running for school board and they're being searched? There, actually, um, Elise Stefanik has been a leader in this. There are, there are provisions that are currently going into effect this year that relate to political candidates also all coming out of the ability to try to prevent the type of abuses that we saw in the Donald Trump campaign because absolutely we saw the, the worst of the intelligence community and I think the worst of the FBI and it is absolutely imperative in these reforms uh, that we make certain that, that we reform them so that can never happen again. And that's what we're doing in the FISA court reform. Well, I'm glad it's, it's happening for presidential candidates. Does the campaign get notified? Uh, we do not have a requirement for the, for the campaign to be notified. We have a requirement for Congress to be able to have the oversight as to what they're doing. So as long as the campaign stays on the good side of Congress, they might be okay. It is bipartisan notification. Um, and to every member of Congress, and, well, and by will I be notified? <laughs> um, it depends on what your role is. I, I, you know, in judiciary, you, you very well could be in a, in a role where you are notified. Will I be? I, I don't know. I don't know uh, how uh, Judiciary Committee is going to be handling those notifications. Will every member of Congress be notified? No, every member of Congress will not be notified. So it'll be like a few chairmen that get to know if a presidential campaign's being spied on? Well, and that's not in this law. That's under current law. Under current law, there are increased notification requirements and limitations as to what they're able to do. Under this law, which absolutely needs to be passed, we have massive reforms that would prevent them to be able to do the, the abuses of Donald Trump in the FISA court. Okay, I started asking about the member of Congress and you went to Donald Trump. I want to go back to the member of Congress. Who gets notified? First of all, I take, a, I, I take objection with the fact that members of Congress get treated specially in this law over regular citizens. I think we all deserve protection under the Constitution. Um, so I think it, I find it really interesting. We've carved out an exemption for members of Congress, but I'm supposed to be comforted by the fact that just a few chairmen will find out. Is that true? Like who gets, if a member of Congress is uh, targeted under FISA, who gets notified? I want to be clear, I'm not taken up for members of Congress. I just want to know how this works. What special, what special treatment do members of Congress again, get in this no, FISA bill? There are no special treatments. So let me, let me again go back to this is a notification requirement rising out of the abuses with respect to the Donald Trump campaign so that we can ferret out political bias. Uh, now, the exact provision, because this is, is, is not in the, um, in, in the areas in which, I mean, there, we're in agreement up here on the four of us on the provisions that are currently in this bill. Um, but um, the, the notifications include uh, both Congress and Senate, uh, the Gang of Eight, and um, the uh, uh, legal counsel for the committee indicates that the provision that's currently in the base bill, and which we're all in agreement with, does include the queried member getting notice. It, it includes who? It does include the queried member uh, receiving notice. What we need to do, because I, I don't have that in front of me, is we need to pull that provision for you and allow you to read it yourself so okay. you become comfortable with it. I think you described it differently earlier. Yes, my understanding was that they would not have gotten notice. Okay. I'm being told that, that they are. So if a member of Congress, let me get this straight, this is a little carve out for members of Congress. If a member of Congress is targeted, even fairly, legally, they get notified, but an American citizen does not. Is that correct? Well, again, as I told you, uh, the exact provision you're asking questions about, they're pulling it right now. We'll make sure we give it to you so you have the exact answer. Because I, I obviously did not have the, the accurate information in front of me when you asked the question. 
Well, let me let me ask um, some of the other members if. if uh, do you know if there's an exception for members of Congress, Chairman Jordan? The notification, uh, yeah, I understand the notification, but what's interesting in the, in the, in the base language is the language is, uh, the language uh, would be the Gang of Eight and that particular member as, as uh, Chairman Turner just told you. I don't think, I don't think the, when the Judiciary Committee gets notified, like the Intel Committee would be notified. What is the Gang of Eight? That's House leadership, Senate leadership, and the, and, the, and the chairman and the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. Does the Judiciary doesn't get notified? We don't get notified. Why wouldn't you notify the Judiciary Committee if, if, if Congress is being spied on? I, I would not have an objection to that. The Judiciary Committee has not asked for that change in the base bill, but I would not have an objection. But, my, but let me go back to my original question. When you're able to answer it, is it true that there that if you're a member of Congress and you're being uh, searched in this database, if, if some member of the Intel Committee is searching for your identifiers in this database, you get notified. But if you're a citizen, one of the other 350 million people who aren't one of the 535 people that are in the House and the Senate, that you get no such notification. Yes, that's, a, that's accurate. Uh, again, I think underscoring what we've spent the bulk of our time here this afternoon, Mr. Massey, talking about is underscoring why you, you still need this fundamental warrant uh, concept, um, the, or the warrant amendment, excuse me. I think it does underscore the reason that we need an underlying uh, warrant requirement. I mean, I think it is wrong to tell members of Congress, and that'll, that'll help this bill pass, no doubt, like the overall bill, if there's no warrant in it, I don't think I think it should be thrown in the garbage if there's no warrant in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those people who might be inclined to agree with me because they're members of Congress and they're worried that they're going to get s this backdoor search done on them and their privacy is going to be violated, there's a little wink and a nod. Don't worry, we got you covered on page, you know, 35, line two. That's for you. That's for you, Mr. Member of Congress. If you are going to be targeted in this database, if we're going to search for you or your house or your home address or anything like that or your phone number, we're going to notify you, but we're not going to do that for the rest of America. I think that's wrong. I don't think, I mean, obviously members of Congress are uncomfortable with renewing this authority, especially given that a member of Congress has, has been targeted using this system. Not targeted for information collection, targeted for searches of information that's already been scooped up, terabytes and millions of emails out there. I doubt they were looking for this member of Congress uh, because they thought he was cooperating with the head of Hamas. I mean, I don't know, I can't know the reason they were in this database fishing around for a member of Congress, and I'm deeply uncomfortable with it because it gets to the balance of power in the government. We're, you know, when we reauthorize this without putting in the constitutional requirements, we are changing the balance of power. But oh, we got a little, we got a little hook here for us, 535, if you're one of the 535. Let me ask, does this ap apply to the non-voting delegates of, of Guam and Puerto Rico? Can your staff tell me? Because I said 535, maybe there's 541. I, I believe it would apply to all members. Yes, it would, it would apply to all members. Well, they're delegates, they're not voting members, but it applies to non-voting members. It, the, the intent, again, is an assumption that it is a politically motivated search and to stop political motivations of both, the, which we've clearly found in the FBI and have been incredibly troubled. Politically motivated search. So if, you, if you're a member of Congress, you'll be notified if you're the target of a politically motivated search. Oh, by the way, you can be one of the six non-voting delegates from Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Washington, D.C., etc. But if you're not in that 430, that club of 435 plus 100 plus six extra who get to come along, they don't get to vote, but they get this special protection, have I left anybody out? presidential candidates get protected. Do they get notified? 
again, it's a different a different provision that, that's that's not in this bill. I can send you the okay. provisions. Okay. So so the new thing that's in this bill, the novel concept, is to give every senator and U, every U.S. rep sort of a special notification if they've been targeted. Is that true? To deter political bias. To deter political bias against an incumbent. Does it apply to campaigns? That is a provision that already is law that we have that we have put. I'll, I'll give you a copy of that. At least Stefanik has been a leader in ensuring that that campaigns also um, are um, are reviewed with this higher level of concern. Again, coming out of the Donald Trump does, campaign. Does a can does a it is not this bill. Does a congressman get uh, a candidate for Congress get notified if they're being targeted? Let's say they're not an incumbent. Again, the, the, you're using the term targeted, and people aren't targeted. Uh, Use whatever term you want, and then I'll ask the question again. Unless, unless they're a foreigner located abroad, those are the ones that are, are targeted. Um, but yes, this provision does relate to the issue of the political bias and attempting to eliminate what we saw with the Donald Trump campaign um, of political bias and what we saw, of course, in the in the searches that have related to other members of Congress that appeared to have been politically biased. So a member of Congress gets notified if they're being queried in this database. Does does somebody who's running for Congress get notified? Not under this provision. Well, isn't that special? Now, if you're an incumbent, you get protection. You get to know when the executive branch has decided to uh, politically target you, because as you said, we're assuming these are politically motivated targetings. If you're a member of Congress, but if you're running for Congress, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't get the same treatment in this bill that members of Congress get. Because I thought I found a loophole there for a second. Everybody should just go register to run for Congress. And it's only 500 bucks in Kentucky, and I got a lot of primary opponents that dis discovered that. But uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're filing, five, spending $500 and running against me because they think they're going to get protected. But it sounds like the reality is they're not going to get protected. The only people who have this special exemption in here to be notified if they're being queried in this database, are sitting members of Congress, sitting senators and sitting U.S. representatives. I think that's a little bit troubling, and I think it was put in there so you could we could pass this. I mean, who wants to vote to spy on themselves? I don't, but you get to vote. You get to vote on whether this bill becomes law and... You know, as long as you stay in Congress, you're going to be fine. So that's what troubles me about this provision is it's put in there, and maybe you get 50 or 100 people who wouldn't have voted for it otherwise are now going to vote for it because they know they've got the pen. they got the congressional pen or the Senate pen, and that's the shield that says, ha, 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 if the... FBI or NSA comes after me, I get to know about it. Nobody else does, but I get to know about it because of this bill. Let me, let me ask how this bill, if it has the uh, amendments that you would like to see passed on the floor, uh, Chairman Turner, how would it expand FISA? I don't believe it expands FISA. Would, um, can you summarize the Intel amendments, what they do? So um, there, are, there are three that, that are of significance. Uh, one uh, relates to counter-narcotics to ensure that um, counter-narcotics is specifically identified as a foreign national security threat. Um, uh, the second uh, relates to uh, vetting of individuals who are seeking entrance to the United States. Again, non-U.S. citizens, uh, non-permanent residents who are seeking um, to enter the United States. The third relates to a, a FISA court decision uh, on a technology, a technological limitation with respect to FISA. Uh, and the, the FISA court recommended that uh, Congress do a technical correction 
and that's the focus. So it do, it sounds like it does expand expand the use of FISA if it's going to like one amendment would expand it in a way that's not being used right now to cover drugs. I personally believe that that narcotics and certainly fentanyl is a national security threat and it should fall under um, under this bill um, and under FISA and 702. Uh, this clarifies it and makes certain, especially since we are, have such an unbelievable scourge that's coming across the border, uh, that, that there's no question that it's included. Okay, so it is going to expand FISA in some ways. Does it still have that uh, provision about the uh, Wi-Fi providers? There, there is no amendment with respect to it. Not amendment, but is in the base text? There's nothing in the base text. Okay. Um, and then, well, finally, I want to ask about the uh, expiration. There's a little bit of oddness in the language that some people have noticed that if this bill expires, it reverts to the text, the, the, the existing text of the FISA law. Do you know about this? I, I don't know what you're referring to now. Uh, let me find it here. Uh, Maybe it's just clumsy wording of the bill, but some people think that there's a revision that uh, when this thing sunsets, it says that the language reverts back to the old FISA. I, I don't know what you're referring to. Is, My understanding from uh, legal counsel is that, and I don't know the particular provision, so you'll have to, to, to point it out, but my understanding is that the provisions of this underlying bill, which again are reforms, uh, is a requirement that the reforms apply immediately, that they're not, that they not be necessary, that it, that, um, that there be any delay in the reforms going fully into effect. Um. I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I will. Here's, here's somebody's concerned, and I, I don't know if it's just clumsy wording or. Uh, Chairman Jordan, do you have, want to speak on this? No, I've, I've heard about this. I don't know if it's clumsy wording or if it's if it does what some people are, are alleging. What I do know is wasn't in the. My understanding is that that language not in the bill that we passed out of our committee. Neither was the language you just spent you know several minutes talking with the chairman on relative to the notification for congressional uh, for members of Congress who have been queried. So, that, those. Those elements weren't part of the bill that came out of uh, the Judiciary Committee, as you would know as, as, as a yeah. great member of our committee. Mr. Mills. Yes, Mr. Himes. There has been some confusion because apparently the wording is a little ambiguous, but this entire program, the entire FISA program, including the reforms, expire after five years post-passage. Okay. But there is some language in there that says the reforms expire concurrent. I mean, I don't know why it's in there. I think I know why it's in there, and I'll ask you all, but I'm hoping somebody will volunteer why this odd wording is in there that um, on the sunset date, Section 702 will revert back to the way it looked before this bill passes, if it should be pass. Why, why would that be in the bill? Maybe staff can explain it to you. Um, my understanding is that it's because it's part of the renewal package. It's just one package, um, and and that. But it, our intention and the language is um, that these go into effect immediately, so there be no delay. I, I know we've had a discussion about this, uh, Mr. Massey, when we were in in the meeting that there is a FISA court approval of um, the uh, FISA surveillance uh, package, and we want to ensure that that this is part of the renewal and that they go into effect. Immediately. Okay, so we can put to bed the rumors that this is to create some permanent uh, authorization of this thing, of the old version of the bill. But um, what I'm wondering if the, is, was that stuck in there so that five years from now, all of these 
we, we start negotiating again without the reforms that you've put in the bill. I mean, I don't. My, my intention would be if, if we find that there's violations that we do additional reforms. Uh, I, I think that 702 is going to be a continuous process. I think the package of reforms that we have is a really good one um, because we found real and absolute abuses. And the intelligence community cannot, and the, specifically the FBI, cannot be allowed uh, to continue the ma manner in which they are uh, without these reforms because I, 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 these abuses ignore the intention of Congress. Can you resolve one thing for me? Um, one of your amendments you mentioned is to deal with counter narcotics like fentanyl, but um, you also in the text of the bill you say you're banning searches for evidence of a crime. How would you stop drugs? Like if, if the bill simultaneously says you can't use FISA 702 to stop a crime or search for a crime, why would you roll counter narcotics into this or drugs? Isn't that a crime? Yeah, Ranking Member Hunt. Yeah, Mr. Massey, I described earlier that in order to become a target, um, one of the 250,000 targets, an individual must fall into one of these buckets, and I named counter proliferation, counter terrorism, foreign intelligence officer. This would add an additional bucket. So it would only allow for the putting on of the target list of Mexican cartel members, Golden Triangle operators, that sort of thing. So again, this would be purely an additional bucket in which non-U.S. targets could be added to the target. To I the got target. it. That, that makes sense to me. So it would expand the use of the program overseas or outside of our borders to include counter-narcotics in addition to terrorism and money laundry. Basically. It would expand the number of targets who would be subject to 702 collection, yes. So uh, then it might also expand the use case, though, if somebody in the United States buys marijuana from one of these people and they show up in the database, but we say we're not going to go after them for that. So. Um, all right, I will, uh, did you, do you guys, uh, Chairman Jordan or Ranking Member Nadler, I haven't spent a lot of time asking you questions. Do you have anything to add? No, just, I would just say that just the expansion is just that. It's an expansion, and when you're expanding who you're going to surveil outside the United States, you're inevitably going to pick up a bunch more Americans, and then there's going to be additional U.S. person queries on those, all again, underscoring why it's important to have a warrant. And one of the... Uh, Amendments proposed by the Intel Committee proposes that uh, 702 uh, apply to anyone crossing our border. That could be immigrate immigrants, legal or illegal, or American citizens. That doesn't make that's any sense true. at all. No, that's not true. Do you want you want to and, and speak to true. that, yes, Chairman you, Turner? I appreciate it. So back to the illicit drugs. I, I do have now the amendment in front of me, and I want to read the, the category. Uh, it says specifically international production, distribution, or financing of illicit synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or other drugs driving overdose deaths or precursors of any aforementioned. And, and I believe that they were you know, are in the bucket already, but, but when you have an opportunity to reform a bill, especially where we have such unbelievable, and certainly you know, we see it in Ohio of the unbelievable fentanyl deaths, the, the threat that we have coming from China, the threat that we have coming from Mexico, the number of, of families across the country that have lost someone uh, to uh, these synthetic drugs and fentanyl, uh, it, I think it was important to put this in as an amendment so that there would be no question that we'd have an ability to pursue those individuals. Okay, um, just to summarize, I mean, I'm concerned that this reauthorization doesn't include even um, a concession to the Constitution about requiring probable cause and a warrant to go search into this database of information, which is enormous. It's an enormous database. It's never actually been characterized here um, in, in this hearing. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. And we're, it's almost like, well, we feel benevolent because there's some reforms in it, but we're not going to add the constitutional requirement. We'll just have some reforms, and we're going to trust the same people who've abused this system for, for over a decade that we know of. I have concerns with that. 
I have concerns that um, anytime I see a bill that has a special provision for Congress, I have real concerns about that. Now, uh, I think it should apply to all Americans. If you're going to be the target of one of these, this is a, just just as it just as it was intended to protect political uh, speech or political viewpoints for congressmen, incumbent congressmen, by the way, not challenging congressional candidates, but incumbent congressmen have this protection. I think every American should have this kind of a protection. In fact, every American should be afforded a warrant. And these these warrants, by the way, that we're asking for in this amendment, they're I mean they're still done by a secret judge. That you know, uh, it's it's not like it's out in the open. There would be nothing exposed in pursuit of these uh, bad foreign actors to require the warrant. I just think it's it's constitutional and we need it, uh, Chairman Jordan. A secret judge with exceptions. Right, a secret, a secret judge. A secret judge with exceptions. I think the fundamental question is, how many U.S. persons would actually be queried who, who don't fall into that exception? That's the number we need to know. That, the, no one knows what, I mean, maybe the, maybe the, my, our colleagues know, but we certainly don't. That, to me, is the fundamental question. So I think um, for this bill to be worth passing on the floor of the House, it needs to have the constitutional protection that it lacks, but that it could have if we have this amendment. And so I... I would urge um, making the amendment for the warrant in order so that we can all vote on this. And I yield back to the chairman. Thank you very much. General Lee from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you. I'll try to have a couple of targeted questions. Um, chairman Turner, you've mentioned several times that there are amendments that are supposed to address some of the FISA um, violations and abuses that were pointed out by the inspector general. You've mentioned them. Is that correct that these reforms to address the abuses are in the form of amendments? They're not part of the base text? No, that, that's what the base text is. There are okay. 55 okay. Um, uh, amendments to the underlying FISA okay. uh, bill, uh, the, the statute, the underlying FISA okay. statute. Okay. Must um, have gotten distracted by some of the conversation. Um, uh, to our chairman and ranking member from judiciary, um, there's been a representation that judiciary doesn't have a problem with the fact that FISA is supposed to be directed at foreign nationals overseas. You're not proposing that there be a warrant requirement before a FISA search is directed at foreign nationals overseas. Nope. Okay, that may be where that 2,000 judges figure might have come in. But um, it, it is this bootstrapping that, that is so concerning that just because someone has been identified through searches on foreign nationals overseas that suddenly it makes them fair game. Um, as though you move into a neighborhood where maybe there's some criminals and therefore the police can search your house. Um, that's where it seems. I was going to ask Mr. Jordan to comment first. I agree. If, if Again. We have if, to write this down. Yeah, if you're going to. Well, God bless you. Uh, the, uh, if you're going to search a U.S. person you're going to search an American citizen. Mm -hmm. Their name, phone number, email address. If you're going to do that, we think it should require a warrant. Mm -hmm. We think it, mm -hmm. and, and again, we felt like in our committee, and you know you work mm -hmm. great in our committee with, with this whole effort, we even provide exceptions in there, mm -hmm. which, which is, you know, that's a big give, frankly. But we think that is just so fundamental, a separate and equal branch of government overseeing the executive branch before mm -hmm. you're going to go mm -hmm. look at Americans' information. As much as it pains me to say so, I think I agree with you completely you on this there one. Um, it, it is something that has stuck out to me throughout. I mean, we have received briefings from our intel community trying to give us examples of, of why this is needed. And in each instance, it has been, well, it's easier if we don't have to get a warrant, even though we are now directly querying about American citizens just because they happen to be in this bucket. So, um, yes, Mr. Nadler. It's exactly right. And these work, forget FISA, forget foreign intelligence, these work would probably be easier if you didn't have the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Right, right. So Certainly. It's exactly the same situation. Certainly that's heard. The warrant requirement in the bill. That's long been an objection to due process in a variety of contexts, is that it makes it harder to throw people in jail or to violate their civil rights. Um, 
I am interested in this idea that there could be this expansion to narcotics cases. Absolutely, we need to address the fentanyl scourge. But it does appear that this could open up, I think, as Mr. Massey suggested, a whole new bucket of Americans being implicated since the data from all sources show that most fentanyl is trafficked across the border by U.S. citizens. So that is going to bring in a whole another tranche of U.S. citizens for a variety of reasons. So I think you might want to be careful with that one. Um, anything else, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, the, the, this, is, this is intended to be an effort to reform FISA and in our case require a warrant for searches of U.S. persons, not an exercise in any type of expansion. Okay, okay I, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for any questions you may have for the panel. Um, I'll be brief. Um, the notification really is Thank interesting. You. Um, <laughs> the notification of members of 535 members of Congress is very interesting. Who put that in there? Actually, the, the bill that you have in, in front of you um, was uh, went through a, um, a working group that was established by the speaker. Um, and so um, this is, they reviewed um, the provisions from both the Judiciary and the Intelligence Committee, and it's those provisions that came out of that working group that are in front of you. This, is, this does not represent either our bill or, or their bill. Um, the, um, there were uh, seven members that were on that committee, and they're the ones that made the final decision as to what went in the underlying bill and what did not. In the notification... We're, uh, we're speaking in favor of that bill that came out of that committee. Okay, but the notification would go to the... How would you... Eight, the eight members of... How would you... Eight gang of eight? Um, it, it's a... Um, um, Repeatedly in statute, when there's a notification to Congress with respect to intelligence issues, they they notify the Gang of Eight. And so it was just leveraged using uh, current procedures. Pre or post? I'm sorry? Notification pre-query or post-query? Let me check on that. It, it's post. So they would have already collected in information and then just took, like, if, if they were going to... There's, Do a, not a, there's not an exception. There is no prohibition. You are correct. So they would have had the information to give out uh, and inform us of it afterward. That is, that's very interesting in here. You're, you are correct. There is no exception. Then that, that's useless. Once the information is out, it's out. So that's the problem. I mean, and like Thomas said, um, this really, with even with the fentanyl, this expands this to really any American, I think, Mr. Natalie, you mentioned that. It's, uh, the, the, the ones coming across the border now, we don't know who they are. So it opens it up to every American. And the notification, as he said, if it's good enough for Congress, uh, that makes the case for the warrant. I don't understand the, and I tried to, Mr. Turner, you first said, I thought you said that mainly you were talking, you've already, the, it's already protected in law uh, that you don't need a warrant for a foreign, for the head of Hamas. But this is for Americans. Uh, the, the so so the, the, the point I keep making, and, and I think it, would, it is, um, is one that as we have this debate, the members are, are going to, um, to, be, to have to, to be given additional information of, of current law. Because current law, and, and, and it, it needs to be absolutely you know, understood, current law requires that if you're going to search American's data, if you're going to look into an American's phone or American's email or, or their data, um, it requires a warrant. Now, that, that, is, that is absolutely the law. There, that, that is constitutional. I, it, is, it, it is fundamental to our basic protections. Um, and, um, and, and nothing in this bill uh, limits or weakens that. It is fundamental to American law, the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution requiring a, a search warrant. However, under Section 702, they have never used search warrants for querying the Section 702 data about American with respect to American citizens. That's why we have the warrant requirement as an amendment 
the right. underlying bill. The underlying bill, frankly, if the warrant amendment is not adopted, uh, I, I think Mr. Jordan and I and would not support the underlying bill unless the warrant amendment is adopted because it, uh, the underlying bill would, would extend uh, the warrantless searches of American citizens. In the case that Thomas mentioned about Mary Catherine in her emails, uh, who's the guardian when you get into, if she's suspected of, you know, colluding with some foreign agency, they're going to look at everything in that email. And who's the guardian to say you need to decipher just the, I mean, where is that, where is that protection? Mr. Norman, under current law, to look at Mary's information or data beyond emails that are, that she has sent to someone that's in the 250,000s of foreigner located abroad, um, they would have to go to court and have a full probable cause hearing. There is no ability to look at her information, regardless of what she even said um, to Putin or the head of Hamas or head of ISIS. Uh, there is a requirement under current law for full a warrant, a probable cause hearing. Yeah, but that this is only true for new data, but for data that's already in the section correct. 702 that's database, I, yeah. they can query that without a warrant. Correct. And that's why we need this warrant amendment. Exactly. That, that's it's, uh, who's going to be the guardian. The, the, that's, that's, this is 2024. What happened to the, the Trump in, I guess, in 19 and 20, or even before? How did that come to light? A warrant is really the notification that's needed before anything is done, particularly with Americans. Right, okay, so that actually was a warrant process. What happened to Donald Trump was a court judicial warrant process, and Devin Nunes, who led our committee at the time, uh, was uh, incredible at ferreting out the abuses that had occurred in the spying on the Donald Trump campaign. And that is why this bill includes reforms and provisions that would stop that from happening in the future. There, there is not an amendment between us that, that uh, amends the provisions of this law that protect, um, the, that change the system to make certain that, that what happened to Donald Trump never happens again. If there was no Dev, Devin Nunes, how would this information get out? Well, it was our, our committee worked in, in concert. Devin Nunes led our committee in, in looking to the underlying because, again, it was the intelligence community. This, as you know, there's a whole movies and books about this. Um, and it, the, um, uh, the intelligence community and the FBI abused the FISA court process uh, and obtained a warrant to, search a, uh, to surveil an American, Carter Page, Carter Page. We are making that under this underlying bill uh, so that that does not happen again. And that does not in, uh, relate to the, um, the amendment upon which we disagree. The underlying bill has provisions of which there's no amendment to strengthen um, that uh, changes that system uh, so that protections are, will be in place. And, and Chairman Jordan's nodding his head. Yeah, there's two parts to FISA. There's, there's the FISA court where you can go and get a warrant to spy on whoever you want to spy on, for American, any American you want to do. And that, was, that process was abused relative to the 2016 presidential election they spied on President Trump's campaign. And then there's a 702 program. To the Mary Catherine example, though, and the ranking member is right, this, this database is big. It, I call, that's why I call it the haystack. It's a haystack of information, but you're going to take Mary Catherine's name or phone number or email, and that's the U.S. person search in that database. You're not searching whoever the foreigner she was talking to. The search is not on that individual. The search is on her. And when the search is on her, on an American, again, get a warrant. Get a warrant. Um, let me ask you another question. On the, I know the 10,000 people that had access to the database has been, has been uh, trimmed back to 500. What penalties are there once the 500 get access to the uh, database when they give that information out? Um, what protection is there that? There are now criminal uh, penalties and prosecutions if the information is leaked. From the 500? So yes, absolutely. Those are, those are reforms that are now in this bill that is before you. Well, the only thing I would say, that the notification issue being carved out for us uh, it, it ought to be for every American. It's, 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 that's not that big of a deal. And like uh, Mr. Nadler mentioned, the SCIF can be set up in any courtroom. That's not reinventing the wheel. That's not that ex expensive. Um, but 
Anyway, it's been an interesting discussion and more interesting discussion follow. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize uh, Mr. Roy from Texas for his questions. I thank my friend from Kentucky. Um, I, a couple of questions here about process. I mean, we're obviously in the Rules Committee. Um, we've had debates and discussions about process. There's been some bipartisan agreement, some bipartisan disagreement. Um, in terms of what gets to the floor and how it gets to the floor. Um, I've got strong concerns about the legislation that gets to the floor of the House under both parties. Um, but that's a larger question for another day. But I, I wanted to make sure I have a clean understanding of the process that has led to this moment, where we currently sit, uh, sitting here on whatever today is, April 10th, um, uh, 2024, wherein we have, I think, a period of time here before uh, FISA expires, having been extended in December for a temporary time, which, of course, triggered an automatic extension, effectively, or, you know, allowed the courts to extend till next spring, till 2025. Um, but so now we've got this important issue. And as I recall, and I wondered if the uh, chairman can clarify for me that, that both committees, Judiciary and Intel, reported out legislation in December, early December, uh, each of their respective bills. Um, and, and, and I'm obviously a member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, and I wonder if I'd ask the, uh, both the chairman and the ranking member. The Judiciary Committee reported out a bill that I believe was, was it 34 to 2? 35 to 2. 35 to 2? Don't sell those short. I, I know, to try not to. Uh, it is one of those rare moments of agreement, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. But uh, so 35 to 2. Uh, if the legislation that is before us today were brought before the House Judiciary Committee, uh, would the, uh, for, I'll ask the chairman, it was unanimous on the Republican side, would it be unanimous on the Republican side if it's reported out as it is unamended in the Judiciary Committee? Oh, no, no, no. Well, well, I, don't even, I don't know if it had even been brought up. It wouldn't have been brought up by the chairman, I understand. Uh, but if it were put to a vote in the Judiciary Committee, as it is, it would it would fail overwhelmingly, right? Overwhelmingly. Would the ranking member concur? I would. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, the bill uh, initially, there was discussions in December to put the bill, well, let me back up. Does the Judiciary Committee have the primary jurisdiction over this topic? Did it when it was originally passed? Does it yes. today? So we have the Judiciary Committee with the primary jurisdiction passed 35 to 2 on a bipartisan basis. We passed legislation, and as I understand it, it was uh, at that point in time supposed to be brought to the floor and then allow amendments, right, in a relatively open process, something we've all been trying to restore uh, but utterly failing to, to uh, be able to carry across the goal line fully. So that is as I understood the initial process. Then there was some wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, then there was a working group that met, and about uh, some period of time through that, as I understand it, there was disagreements between the Intel Committee and Judiciary Committee. Is that a fair characterization of what occurred? Uh, that's fair. Is that would the would the chairman and ranking member of the Intel Committees do they agree that there was a working group that was put together, and that there was then a disagreement, or a number of disagreements between Judiciary and Intel, that then led us to an impasse in December? Is that a fair characterization? The speaker formulated his own working group uh, after he replaced Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. And so then, so then there was, a, I believe, uh, a, a kind of pause, if you will. There was some discussion of Queen of the Hill. Let's put both bills on the floor. There was a bunch of back and forth. So now we got through that kind of second debate. There was then a third iteration of a working group, which I believe then had a different group of members, which had some members of the judiciary and, and intel, but also had some leadership members, uh, some other committee members, non-judiciary intel. Uh, and that that debate then occurred, and that then from that there was base text created with a promise of amendment votes on virtually everything that we couldn't come to agreement on. Isn't that roughly what was being discussed? I think that might have been January-ish. Is that rough character? Okay. Then the, the uh, and, and I saw the chairman of judiciary ranking his head yes, just for, for the record. So then, then I believe that kind of got side railed, uh, and then we're we're told each. Uh, then we had a version that said, well, each side will get three amendments, and there will be a standalone vote on a fourth vote on amendment uh, on the uh, fourth amendment not for sale, Mr. Warren Davidson's amendment. I believe that was then a discussion point. 
And I believe that was what then came to this committee about a month and change ago, right? That we came to this committee with the base text that came out of that process. And they'd have three amendments on each side, but then there was going to be a potential vote on this Fourth Amendment not for sale. Is that also a fair characterization? I believe that the Judiciary Chairman is, is ranking his head yes. So now, then, then we're told, another iteration, that the Fourth Amendment not for sale is off the table. And now what we're being told is, is that there might be a separate vote on the Fourth Amendment not for sale, but it'll be a uh, vote on, you know, under suspension of the rules, which almost certainly guarantees its failure. So I say that as the backdrop because this is the Rules Committee. We're supposed to be the safeguards of the process. We're supposed to be the safeguards of how law is, you know, made and brought forward. And a whole big debate about whether legislation gets sort of created behind closed doors and then drop down with a sort of take it or leave it approach. And rather than putting this bill on the floor and just offering a bunch of amendments and letting the cards fall where, may, where they may, for example, Mr. Davidson's amendment, which has now been ruled uh, unable to be considered, um, and other amendments that I think others would occur. For example, I'd love to have an amendment that would say, why don't we just have a one-year reauthorization, two-year reauthorization, three-year reauthorization. Now, why might I want to do that? Well, because we've got a lot of divisions here. There's been a lot of debate. Uh, everybody here recognizes that there's important uh, issues at play with 702. We want to maintain some of those powers, be able to go after bad actors directed towards foreign actors. And, uh, but we also want to protect American citizens. So why can't we just have an amendment that says, let's do a two-year reauthorization so that maybe we can you know, see how these reforms work and if they're not working so well, not have to wait for five years to see if there's another 230,000 Americans or whatever the number is that get, uh, get spied upon. That's the backdrop. I would just ask the, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, because I believe before I got here, forgive me, my plane was delayed after the uh, eclipse population in Texas filled the airports up <laughs> rather full. Um, it was pretty cool, though. Uh, the... Um, uh, the ranking member, because you did talk about process, I was getting some updates while I was in the air, that um, would you concur with roughly what I just laid out and that that's concerning from a process perspective? Yes. And does that, match, yes. so this, does that match some of the things you were raising before I got here? It does. So, so having said that, one of the issues that I, I want to uh, explore that I don't think was explored by my friend from Kentucky, and I do want to say that I associate myself with I think all of the remarks uh, of the of the gentleman from Kentucky, but they were there were a long set of remarks, so so it's a little bit of risk in doing that. But I believe that I associate myself with every of uh, every bit of his concerns that he laid out and the questions that he was asking. But but there was another there's another uh, issue that I think merits um, a concern, which is when I look at the language of the text of the Narcotics Amendment. The, the Narcotics Amendment, and, and look, as I say, this is a Texan who had six children die in the school district in which my family lives from narcotics, I mean from fentanyl uh, poisonings. Uh, it is a terrible scour scourge to use the word I believe the chairman of Intel used a moment ago. We share that belief. Uh, I certainly want to use the, the full force of the government uh, as possible to go after the foreign actors and the cartels in Mexico, whatever we can do to stop their assault on this country. That being said, um, the way this is drafted raises concerns. Um, and I say that as a federal prosecutor who would associate himself with the remarks, I believe it was the ranking member, but I think uh, others, about, of course we want every bit of information we can get if you want to go prosecute bad guys. Of course, right? I mean, if you're, if you're in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you want to get every bit of information you can possibly get so that you can go after people with whatever that might be. I remember I had a, a, I think I mentioned this in committee before, but Merritt's mentioning again, in one case I had a phone uh, from a bad guy that, uh, that I was able to uh, uh, put behind bars uh, for being a felon in possession, but he had a phone filled with all sorts of incriminating stuff that we wanted to go pursue. And the cop grabbed the phone when they, uh, I was a Terry Stop or whatever, when they searched the guy and uh, grabbed the phone and unfortunately downloaded the stuff off the phone before he got a warrant for the phone. And that was a problem. And I was unfortunately unable to use said information off of the phone to go after said bad guy. And there was a lot of good stuff on there. Um, and, uh, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And you need the brakes put on both prosecutors, law enforcement broadly, foreign intelligence collectors, to make sure that they're not abusing it. Now, 
my question on the narcotics amendment, right? I, well, the way I read the, the text of the amendment, there's nothing specific related to illegal drugs internationally that wouldn't be swept in generally. I mean, it, the language that says, you, 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 you know, it says production. Well, you know, does that, uh, does that count Sudafed? Uh, you know, if, if we have got lots of Americans who, by the way, who go to Mexico and buy drugs for a variety of reasons, we could start debating drug policy and so forth here. But so you go overseas and you buy Sudafed. Well, we all get that. Like, what's, what's the deal here? It's like, what, what are precursors in this context? You know, what, what, what is a, you know, what, what about, uh, you know, uh, the ingredients like in cold medicine that can be used in meth and so forth? We all know that's how it's done. So can an American be swept up under this? I'd ask the chairman if, if, if you believe that that could be possible here. I'm opposed to the amendment. I'm, I'm, and my, for me, it's more just fundamental grounds. I don't think we're, this, this is a bill to be expanding FISA. I think uh, Congressman Massey established mm -hmm. that fact, as you pointed out in his good questioning a little while ago. Um, so I, I'm opposed to the amendment. There could be there could be problems with how it's drafted. I haven't looked at the, the specific language as close as maybe you have, uh, Congressman Roy. I'm just opposed to expanding FISA, and I know this does that. I, I wonder if, if the chairman of, of Intel could uh, illuminate uh, us on whether we believe people could get swept into that uh, under that kind of loose definition of production. Right. So the the language specifically is international production, distribution, or financing of illicit synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or other drugs driving overdose deaths or precursors of any of the aforementioned. So it has qualifiers, one, of it requires that they're illicit, illegal. Um, Sudafed's not illegal. Um, that they be specifically in the category of synthetic opioids, cocaine, or other drugs, and it specifically uses the language driving overdose deaths, the, 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 the cost that families in our country have paid for the, the illegal fentanyl uh, trade that's happening in the United States is, is just heartbreaking. Um, this provision, uh, as all of FISA in 702, which we've all agreed is, is, is the case, uh, relies, relates only to foreigners located abroad. Uh, it is not uh, Americans, it's not people located uh, legally in the United States, it's foreigners located abroad who are involved in international production, distribution, or financing of illicit, again, illegal, synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or drugs driving overdose death. Well, it, what, it, it still leaves me wondering when we talk about precursors, and it still leaves me uh, wondering when we're talking about the production of illicit drugs. Well, I mean, meth kills lots of people. And, I mean, I, I can't even go in America and go buy certain drugs without showing ID and, and going through certain hurdles because of uh, the concern how those products are being used to create and develop illicit drugs. So my concern here, right, is because we're talking about the expansion of the power uh, of, of government with respect to surveillance and for law enforcement, that this seems like this is a very loose tool. And again, as someone who very much wants to stop the, the drug trade and very much wants to uh, uh, you know, eliminate the, the uh, death and devastation from fentanyl and all these um, synthetic drugs. Um, nevertheless, my primary concern here is the expansion, which I believe it most certainly clearly is, an expansion of the use of 702. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm uh, I, I, it also begs the question of, because um, it came up a minute ago about, uh, Mr. Massey asked about the Wi-Fi issue and I do believe, right, I mean, there is an amendment, right, that, that addresses that issue and, and that it raises certain concerns in terms of its breadth and in terms of what it might sweep in. Um, and in fact, if I remember right, in the amendment, the, um, the definition has specific exclusions for senior centers, hotels, um, coffee shops, those kinds of things, right? But it would beg the question that those specific exclusions sort of raises the concern about then, well, who are you including? So if you need the exclusions, uh, doesn't that raise the specter of a fairly broad piece of language uh, for which it needed to have specific exclusions identified? And I, I just wondered if the, if the Intel chairman might be able to respond uh, to that question. Right, so again, 702 applies to foreigners located abroad. 
Um, so it doesn't relate to your local Starbucks. It doesn't relate to your local hotel. It doesn't relate to your local Wi-Fi system. Uh, there are individuals who have raised concerns uh, to both Sherry and to the Intelligence Committee uh, about um, provisions that relate to um, uh, technological issues of FISA collection. This, this language responds to those concerns. But once again, you, you can't be at your local McDonald's and be a foreigner located abroad. I mean, the bill only relates to collecting on foreigners located abroad. So you can't be at McDonald's in Dayton, Ohio, or in Texas, because you've come and watched the eclipse, uh, and be a foreigner located abroad. Um, and, but we just wanted to make sure that people had these specific items that people have raised um, specifically eliminated. But as, as you'll recall, when you start with the category of it's only foreigners located abroad, it, it by definition cannot be these things. But we wanted to expressly uh, state these things so people uh, would not have concerns. So I, I just wonder if, if either the chairman or ranking member of judiciary would have anything to add to that, because as I remember correctly, I mean, it, it, I, mean I, I, I hear what the um, Intel chairman is saying, um, but, but again, all of this is interconnected. It's the whole point. It, it's, it's, it's how the tools are being used. I mean, so you, you know, identify a subject you want to go after, but you're then collecting information in order to go after said subject. Um, and, and by the way, the definition still allows you not to be targeting one individual, but be, you know, targeting anybody uh, kind of related to it uh, under some broader uh, kind of scope. And here, you know, we went through this before, and I don't remember all this, but, uh, you know, we, we rejected previous regimes, the whatever it was, the Protect America Act and other mechanisms that we specifically rejected um, because we didn't want it to be too broad, but yet this is now putting a toe back in that water to create not even just a toe, like a whole foot is jumping in back into that water. I wonder if the Judiciary Committee uh, Chairman and or Ranking Member would have anything to add to that. Well, there are a number of uh, amendments uh, to the underlying bill which would expand uh, FISA greatly, which would expand uh, um, the, the surveillance of Americans greatly. And you mentioned some of them, the, uh, the, the def expanding the definition of electronic communication services, um, the one that uh, would, would, would apply to anybody crossing our borders. Um, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Jordan, anything to add? I, I would just, again, I'm, I'm opposed to expanding it. I, I view the three amendments offered by our, our, our friends and colleagues from the Intel Committee as being expansions of FISA. Um, the most important thing is where we spent the bulk of our time today, requiring a warrant to search U.S. persons. Plain and simple. That is the most important thing. Without that in the bill, I think the ranking member, if I've said this a number of times, without that in the legislation, we're not going to support it. Exactly right. Um, and to clarify on that point with respect to a warrant requirement in terms of what we would like to see added and what we put in the Judiciary Committee product, it would do nothing to truly restrict the government's ability to use Section 702 to target foreigners outside the United States, right. correct? Correct. It simply reiterates the existing Fourth Amendment protection, um, but makes clear that it will, in fact, be followed by requiring uh, it to be uh, followed. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, because it's not being followed now when a U.S. Right. person is, their data is searched in this, what I, again, call the haystack of information. Um, I, I would ask one other, you know, I, I, there's an amendment that uh, is something that I offered in the Judiciary Committee and that I think is um, important. And, and I would ask uh, the Judiciary C uh, Committee, Chairman Ranking Member, then I'll, and I'll ask the Intel guys, that um, you know, the bill includes the notification to Congress and members of Congress, info is searched as, as Mr. Massey outlined. And I offer an amendment that would require um, that Congress be notified on a quarterly basis rather than annual. And, and the, the re rationale from my perspective even though I would have preferred monthly, but uh, I got I got uh, uh, asked to make it quarterly uh, in the committee. But uh, but but we moved moved it to quarterly because I believe Congress will be able to better follow what's happening in real time to to the American people and be able to know in a more active basis. So uh, I, that's 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 the purpose. And then there's another piece to the amendment which I think is important, which is to require that the Judiciary Committee 
uh, chairman and ranking member, be able to go to the FISC proceeding and be able to go there and observe what is in fact occurring. And so I would, I would uh, ask the Judiciary Committee chairman and ranking member if you believe that amendment is a step in the right direction um, and something that would merit uh, importance uh, in addition to obviously our desire that there be a warrant protecting the American citizens, that we have a member of Congress be able to locate and go to the FISC, observe, and get more detailed and more uh, and reports on a, on a more regular basis. I, I certainly agree. And uh, the chairman's uh, nodding in the affirmative as well, uh, Chairman Jordan. Uh, and I wonder if you'd be surprised that, that we were reached out to by the Department of Justice in my office to uh, back off of the requirement that the Judiciary Committee Chairman and Ranking Member be uh, uh, allowed to sit in the proceeding. And we were, we were told to do that because, or asked to do that because it might be constitutionally problematic, separation of powers. So I, I just want to be clear that what I was being uh, asked to do under the guise of separation of powers was to say that a Fisk court, which of course has Article Three ramifications, the executive branch, Article 2, uh, all under laws formed by Article 1, that we would say that it would be constitutionally problematic for us to take the chairman and the ranking member of the elected uh, members of Congress who are sitting in the chair and ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, with primary jurisdiction, jurisdiction over this subject with primary jurisdiction over the Department of Justice and the FBI, that it would somehow be constitutionally problematic from a separation of powers perspective to have them there. Would the chairman and ranking member like to comment on that? I agree. You agree with me that that's yes. ridiculous? Yeah, I don't, I, I, again, I don't think the amendment calls for any type of uh, any type of uh, activity that would be involved. We're not. We're not going to. Uh, we're just observing. We're just right. there watching. Just like uh, just like I went to a Supreme Court argument a couple weeks ago and watched right. that Supreme Court argument. So, uh, as long as it's only that, I don't see. I don't see a constitutional concern. If there's some kind of task or or procedure that we're supposed to be involved in, I think that would be, and we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Would raise that. a question. There's a, there's at least a question about that. And so uh, to that end, uh, and I would I would add is that. Uh, uh, it was raised as, um, as the question was raised as like, well, why, why would you be there? That was the question. And the, the answer was, because someone needs to protect the American citizen. Because someone needs to be sitting there looking and saying, hey, American citizen, one of the 200 and something thousand odd who had their privacy violated, or the, as Mr. Massey noted, 300 and 30 million Americans who don't have an election certificate sitting in Congress who are getting the protections that this bill would offer, that maybe one of those or two of those members of those 535 be able to sit in there. And, and by the way, it was, it was beyond just those two, right? I believe the amendment uh, includes intel, includes uh, leadership on both sides, a bipartisan basis. And so uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would observe that. I know we've got votes being called, and we'll have time to debate this on the floor. I've been trying to give it the full, full uh, force that it deserves, given that Mr. Massey bought me some time when I was flying back from Eclipse Mania. But I, look, I, I would just uh, want to end with, with this point, which is I don't believe this is the right way to, to, to do this. I don't believe this is the right way to conduct business. I don't believe that this legislation is going to uh, represent, um, I think, the best bipartisan protection of the American people uh, that we could produce. And I believe we can and should do better. Uh, and I believe that we should have the ability to offer amendments that are not being offered right now. Um, but we're trying to weigh all this and figure out the best way to proceed, given the expiration. Again, I would prefer to be able to offer an amendment to shorten the term of the reauthorization, and we'll continue to have some debates here uh, the rest of the day. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Ms. Ledger Fernandez for her questions. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for having missed uh, the opening. I was uh, handling the uh, House Natural Resources, uh, and it was all bipartisan down there. Uh, there were a lot of good bills that we were all supportive of, and it made me remember that uh, Valentine's Day when we had the chair and the <laughs> ranking member in, and it was like a love fest here. So I am sorry that I missed the Intelligence Committee, because it sounds like you too would have also 
been in agreement on many of the elements in uh, this version of the bill, uh, which brings the issue that I think bipartisan is very important that we get there, but that we also need to come to an agreement uh, that uh, meets the, the, the many areas in that we know we'll be able to get something passed since this is uh, ticking mm -hmm. and that there appear to be issues that aren't resolved and whether or not we're going to be actually having a rule or having a vote and what we're doing here. So I will wait to see what happens. And given the shortness of time, I uh, once again, uh, my apologies for not being here for uh, your uh, presentations, which I, I'm sure was equally as uh, bipartisan as the judiciary was. I call it the alternate universe uh, in the Rules Committee. Uh, so I'm sorry I missed that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Yields back. I now recognize Mr. Burgess for his questions. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't go into questions, but I do feel obligated to point out that it was 22 years ago tonight that I actually won a runoff election for the Republican nomination for the 26th District of the State of Texas that I was not supposed to win. But just like Mr. Turner and Mr. Cole, we came in in that class, and it was our highest priority coming on the the heels of the disaster at 9-11, that that never happened again. So while there's obviously not complete agreement here, this is an important topic, and uh, I'm glad to see we're giving it the uh, the attention it deserves. And I'll yield back to Mr. Massey. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you for appearing before us today. Witnesses are now excused. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, right. Time to vote. I'd like to welcome our second panel, Representative Adrian Smith and, uh, from the Committee on Ways and Means. Representative Smith, I welcome your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Massey and the entire committee, <clears throat> the Rules Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Extending Limits of U.S. Customs Water Act introduced by Representative Mike Waltz. This bill protects and strengthens America's national security and economic interests. This bill helps the brave men and women of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection enforce U.S. trade laws by doubling the distance that CBP can operate off the U.S. coast from 12 to 24 nautical miles. This is something that has been done via presidential proclamation under both Presidents Reagan and Clinton, but has never been codified in law. The result is seizures by CBP occurring beyond the 12-mile limit are often challenged in court. We need to remove this legal ambiguity by enacting the 24-mile range into law consistent with the authority that the U.S. Coast Guard currently has. Americans need and want stronger enforcement of our trade laws. In the Ways and Means Committee hearings in New York and Minnesota last year, working Americans asked Congress to do more to enforce trade rules. American workers and job creators need those rules to be enforced so they have a fair and level playing field to compete against their foreign competitors. When malicious foreign actors break the law, it is Main Street and all consumers who pay the price. Farmers and families are both threatened <clears throat> by the illegal imports of unsafe food. Small businesses face potential bankruptcy from foreign competitors that steal intellectual property and then turn around and sell cheap knockoffs to unsuspecting Americans. CBP needs tools to better enforce the trade laws that help secure America's global competitive edge. CBP should be fully empowered to protect our national security, enforce our trade laws, and increasing their range to 24 miles to inspect the cargo of foreign vessels will help do exactly that. Making this change will also help protect American families from the illegal narcotics trade. The entire business model of international crime rings is built on harming Americans, whether it's trafficking poisonous drugs or smuggling unsafe, illegal products into our country. Many of these criminals are drug rings or cartels smuggling the illegal drugs fueling our nation's tragic drug crisis. The volume of drugs that CBP's Air and Marine Operations Unit has captured is actually frightening. In fiscal year 2022 alone, they seized over 200,000 pounds of cocaine, over 75,000 pounds of marijuana, and 146 pounds of fentanyl. 
That amount of fentanyl is, killing enough, is enough to kill millions of Americans. More than 80% of those drugs were seized on the water. It is not just drugs that are smuggled into the U.S. Humans are also being trafficked into the country, as we all know. By expanding in law and the area in which they can operate, CBP agents will have more flexibility to capture and arrest criminals smuggling drugs and people into our country. This legislation earned universal bipartisan support in the Ways and Means Committee. It's a common sense approach to protecting our nation's national and economic security. Thank you for your time. Look forward to answering your questions. Or going to vote. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, for the record, Mr. Panetta was going to be here, but he's not here. So we will go ahead and start questions if you have any questions for um, Adrian. And if does the gentleman from Texas have done such a thorough job, I <laughs> gentleman from Texas has no questions. Um, no, I, I just members recognize. You pointed out that this bill received a 37 to zero vote in the Ways and Means Committee. I'm just curious why we're doing this in the Rules Committee and not just bringing it up in the suspension. Um, because I'm told it's going to be a closed rule anyway. So I, is there a reason why we're here in rules on this? That's, um, uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't uh, be able to answer that. I, maybe just to get the number of closed rules up higher. Uh, you're already the most closed Congress in the history of our country, so I don't, but anyway, whatever. I'm not, I, I assume we'll get a, a near unanimous vote tomorrow as well. I yield back. Thank um, the gentleman from Massachusetts and after he catches his breath, I'll, I'll recognize Mr. <laughs> Panetta. Thank you for joining us um, for this hearing. Um, and I now recognize you for your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Smith, good afternoon. Um, tonight I'm asking for support, uh, as you heard, for the legislation authored and introduced by uh, our good friend, Mike Waltz of Florida, the Extending Limits of U.S. Customs Waters Act. The bipartisan legislation would extend the customs waters of the United States from 12 to 24 nautical miles. Such a change in the boundaries would greatly assist Customs and Border Patrol air and marine operations in their current fight against combating the trafficking of illegal narcotics and people in our contiguous waters. Now, for the most part, I'm sure that many of us believe that we must do more to help law enforcement in its current battle to prevent smuggling by land, air, and sea. However, when it comes to the open sea, our existing laws undermine our ability to go after smugglers in U.S. waters. Currently, the CBP's Air and Marine Operations, AMO as I'll be referring to them, patrols our custom waters and is charged with preventing the unlawful entry of goods and people. However, that task is burdened due to the existing parameters of what they are charged to defend. What do I mean by that? Well, our coastal domain is over 95,000 miles long includes few barriers, yet it's only 12 nautical miles from shore. That thin curtain, as I'll call it, is easily pen penetrable by criminal organizations who smuggle drugs and people. The issue, though, is that the current law prevents AMO from operating outside of those 12 miles of custom waters, even though contiguous waters of the U.S. go all the way out to 24 nautical miles. By extending AMO's range to 24 nautical miles, we are giving AMO more authority to respond and to do their job. Now, a safe interception of a suspected vessel takes time and resources by the AMO. When there's a suspected vessel, AMO needs coordination, which takes time and allows traffickers a chance to get out of range going beyond the 12 nautical miles where AMO can operate. Criminal, criminal trafficking organizations also have become more sophisticated using flight tracking software and encrypted communications to spot AMO aircraft and boats and know exactly how long they have to get out of range. And yes, the smugglers are using faster, stealthier vessels to avoid detection and quickly depart the 12 mile zone. Unfortunately, we're experiencing smugglers taking advantage of this limitation on AMO. In 2022, 702 pounds of fentanyl were seized offshore. That's in the waters, gentlemen, up to 70s and lady. If there are any, there aren't any. Uh, and up to 76%, that was up 76% from fiscal year 21. That was followed by a 12% increase in overall offshore drug seizures from fiscal year 2022 to fiscal year 2023. And although that amount was stopped, like I said, that means it's safe to assume larger amounts got through, unfortunately. 
That's why an extension of AMO's enforcement authorities in custom waters from 12 to 24 nautical miles would not only give AMO more range to track down vessels, but it would also allow them to set up interdictions farther away from shore and safely away from law-abiding boaters. This authority also would give AMO the space that they need to stop the flow of illegal drugs through our maritime borders and align customs, and align customs waters with the contiguous zone. Beyond stopping illegal narcotics, AMO has the authority to intercept vessels that are smuggling people on the sea, which unfortunately has become one of the most dangerous ways to enter into any country in the world, including in 2022. Here in the U.S., it was one of the deadliest years for sea migration to the United States, with 65 people dying on, one journey, on the journey. Many of the vessels used to smuggle these people these days are often not built for the waters they are on, nor are they equipped for the long journeys and the bouts of bad water well, that weather that they can experience. The U.S. Coast Guard reports that just about every vessel they encounter is constructed haphazardly with improvised materials and with absolutely no concern for the people on board. Moreover, smugglers often overload their vessels to maximize profits, risking capsizing and unfortunately the loss of life. So when AMO encounters migrants on suspicious vessels, these operations often become rescues, with many on board being sick, severely dehydrated, or injured, or even overboard in the water. Fortunately, AMO doesn't just stop the vessels. AMO, the AMO personnel are trained and equipped to care for the people on board or rescue those in the water. Many are actually trained as EMTs, and all agents are trained first responders. Simply put, Coming to the U.S. by sea is extremely dangerous, and AMO has a duty to prevent the loss of life by rescuing those trapped aboard dangerous vessels and discouraging this deadly form of migration. I believe it's clear that AMO's job is to stop vessels that are trafficking drugs and humans, to protect the people that are on board those vessels, and to prevent illegal drugs from hitting our streets. The Customs Water Act would increase AMO's authority to 24 nautical miles and greatly assist them in this critical mission. So I ask for your support of the, a of the AMO in their mission for safer seas, for secure borders, by supporting the Customs Waters Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Panetta, for your testimony. Um, do any Republicans have questions for this panel? Seeing none, do any Democrats have questions for this panel? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, seeing there are no further questions, I want to thank you for appearing before us today, and the witnesses are excused. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're going to recess for votes and reconvene after the last vote in the series. Without objection, the committee stands in recess. Subject to the call of the chair.
I couldn't read that. <laughs> Are you going to dump water on me? <laughs> All right. The committee will reconvene to continue consideration of H.R. 7888, the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, H.R. 529, the Extending Limits of the U.S. Customs Water Act, H. Res. 1112, Denouncing the Biden Administration's Immigration Policies, and H. Res. 1117, Opposing Efforts to Place One-Sided Pressure on Israel with Respect to Gaza. Um, I would like to welcome our third panel, Representative Klein and Ranking Member Nadler from the Committee on Judiciary. Representative Klein, I welcome your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm here to testify today regarding HRES 1112, denouncing the Biden administration's immigration policies. Just over three years ago, Joe Biden took office as President of the United States and immediately began upholding his campaign promises to reverse the Trump administration's immigration policies. On day one, the President issued executive orders that sent the world a message that America's borders are open. He used his executive authority to stop border wall construction, rescind the Remain in Mexico policy, prevent the removal of any illegal alien, and block ICE and CPB from enforcing immigration laws. In the weeks and months that followed, President Biden terminated Trump-era policies aimed at preventing fraudulent asylum claims, ending catch and release, increasing criminal alien removals, and preventing illegal immigration. And what was the result of Biden's radical and dangerous systematic dismantling of policies that work to reduce and prevent illegal immigration? Why, the biggest mass illegal immigration wave in the history of the United States. More than 8 million illegal aliens have been encountered by Customs and Border Protection on the southwest border, approximately the population of my home state, the Commonwealth of Virginia. There have been 38 straight months with more than 100,000 southwest border CPB encounters. The Biden administration has released more than 4.6 million illegal aliens into American communities, in addition to the 1.8 million known gotaways avoiding apprehension. And that's just those we know. At least 350 illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list have been encountered by Border Patrol along the southwest border. At the same time, the Biden administration has sharply reduced the number of removals of aliens from this country, including removals of convicted criminal aliens. Who could have predicted these results? Well, Trump administration officials did for one, and congressional Republicans did for another, and career CBP and other DHS employees did. They even warned the Biden transition team not to rescind policies like migrant protection protocols and Title 42. But politics trumped common sense. And the American people are left with the national security, public safety, and financial disaster that the Biden administration's immigration agenda has wrought. After three years of chaos, the Biden administration seems to have finally gotten the message that Americans get uneasy when they see mobs of illegal aliens beating up New York City police officers, watch endless numbers of illegal aliens stream across the southwest border, and hear the heart-wrenching details of murders like that of 22-year-old nursing student Lake and Riley by illegal aliens who should not have been here in the first place. So after three years and with an election on the horizon, President Biden's handlers have decided that the time is now to finally admit what is happening on the southwest border is indeed a crisis. And it's time to blame Congress. But the American people know better. They know that if President Trump was able to establish the most secure border in American history, despite open border groups rushing to get his immigration policies enjoined by activist courts at every turn, then Joe Biden could also use executive authority to help secure the border. They know that President Biden simply refuses to take action. President Biden knows it too, but he refuses to act because open borders advocates have told him not to do so. Months ago, the president announced he would take executive action to quell the border crisis created by his policies. But instead, President Biden continues to sell out the American people by cowering to the far left fringes of his party, the radicals who insist that even the meekest and most minor of reforms are, quote, extreme, inhumane, and cruel. Indeed, President Biden refuses to re-implement the migrant protection protocols, to stop abusing discretionary case-by-case -case and other parole authority, and to re-implement President Trump's asylum cooperative agreements so we can remove illegal aliens seeking asylum to third countries. 
President Biden refuses to expand the use of expedited removal, refuses to use 212F authority to suspend the entry of aliens to secure the border, and refuses to end catch and release. President Biden refuses to comply with the mandatory detention statutes of the Immigration and Nationality Act for inadmissible aliens, and he refuses to rein in the use of taxpayer-funded benefits for illegal aliens. The American people can see that President Biden's approach stands in stark contrast to that of President Trump, who only refused to give up on refuse, who only refused to give up on securing our border. Instead of using his authority to fix his border disaster, President Biden touts the failed Senate border deal, the same failed Senate border deal that was denounced by rank and file border patrol agents, who rightly said the bill would only continue and indeed codify the president's catch and release policies. The same failed Senate border deal that would not have secured the border. You don't have to take my word for it. Senator Murphy, one of the architects of the deal, said it himself. According to him, under the Senate deal, quote, the border never closes. Or you can simply read the bill yourself, which states that the illegal alien subject to its provisions, quote, shall be released. To the everyday American, the answer to the border crisis is simple. Secure the border and enforce the law. That's what the Trump administration did. That's what America needs. And that is what President Biden refuses to do. HRES 1112 affirms that President Biden has the executive authority to help control the border, affirms that the Biden administration is refusing to use that authority, and urges President Biden to immediately begin using that executive authority. H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act, as passed by the House, would enhance current law to help ensure the border is controlled. Senate Democrats have been refusing to bring that bill to the Senate floor for almost a year now. In the meantime, President Biden should use his executive authority to ensure the national security and public safety of Americans is paramount. He should use it to help secure the border. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Um, and I won't say welcome to the committee because you've been here almost as long as I have so uh, today. <laughs> so, um, But I welcome your testimony, Mr. Nambler. Thank you. Madam Chair, Ranking Member McGovern, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this resolution. Madam Chair, this country is facing real problems. There is an erosion of trust in our government and institutions. The right to bodily autonomy is under attack across the nation. Our ally Ukraine is in desperate need of additional aid so it can defeat Putin's unlawful invasion. The state of Maryland needs assistance in rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge so that the Port of Baltimore, whose economic impact touches communities across the country, can reopen. And our immigration system cannot function because Congress has failed to reform it for over 30 years. But instead of responding to these problems, House Republicans are wasting our time yet again on another meaningless immigration resolution. At Donald Trump's direction, they refuse to work towards solutions for our broken immigration system. So instead, all they have to offer is a bunch of empty rhetoric. This resolution, like the others we have considered in recent months, will do nothing to solve the situation at the border. Not a single dollar will go to help our law enforcement agents at the border as a result of this resolution. Not a single person will be denied unlawful entry to this country as a result of this resolution. Not a single community will be made safer as a result of this resolution. This resolution is nothing more than a highlight reel of the dubious talking points in immigration that we have heard over and over from Republicans since President Biden was sworn into office. It is the same legislating by press release that we, that we have become accustomed to in this historically unproductive Congress. The resolution itself is simply a rehash of the resolution we passed just last month. Republicans are so out of ideas that it even has the same title as the last resolution. That resolution listed all the ways that President Biden supposedly could secure the border and essentially asked the administration to reverse every policy it has implemented in immigration even though we know that doing so would not be effective. Today's resolution simply lists most of those policies again, and this time it just condemns the administration. What a waste of time. It is important to remember how we got here. Earlier this Congress, House Republicans passed their partisan, cruel, and unworkable border bill, H.R. 2. Republicans spent a year saying that H.R. 2 is the only way to secure the border even though they know that it cannot become law, having failed twice to pass the Senate, receiving just 32 votes earlier this year in a body with 49 Republican senators. 
Then they insisted that the price of helping protect Ukraine against Russian aggression was enacting harsh border enforcement legislation. Senate Republicans even managed to convince some Democrats to agree to a border bill in the Senate, a bill that Minority Leader McConnell called the toughest border bill in 30 years, negotiated by one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate, Jim Langford. But Republicans could not take yes for an answer. Donald Trump said that he didn't want to do anything that might help at the border in an election year, because he wants immigration as a campaign issue. Other Republicans said it aloud, too, saying they don't want to, quote, do too damn much to help a Democrat, unquote. Folding to the cult of Donald Trump, and just hours after the 370-page text of the bill was released, the Senate passed bill, Speaker Johnson declared the bill dead on arrival in the House, with the rest of the Republican conference quickly falling in line. The Republicans showed clearly what Democrats have been saying over and over again, that they don't want to do anything that would help address our broken immigration system. They clearly have given up. Instead of solving the problem, Republicans merely want to continue to weaponize the border as a political issue for the election year with pointless votes on meaningless resolutions that accomplish nothing and are full of misleading information. So let's review the facts once again. The resolution complains that the Biden administration is not removing enough people. However, the administration is removing people at a very significant pace and in ways that I am concerned may present some due process violations. Since the end of Title 42 last May, the Biden administration has removed or returned over 630,000 individuals and members of family units, 630,000. This is more than the number of people removed or returned in all of fiscal year 2019 under the Trump administration. The resolution also alleges that the Biden administration is violating the mandatory detention statutes by not detaining enough people. However, no administration, including the Trump administration, has ever been able to comply with those statutes because no Congress has ever appropriated extraordinary levels of funding such compliance would require. To detain everyone that the law requires to be held in mandatory detention would require Congress to appropriate over $35 billion a year, a number 10 times higher than what Congress appropriated this year or that former President Trump ever requested for detention. And when Democrats are proposing giving DHS the resources to do its job, Republicans have consistently said no. So I'm not sure how anyone can say that the border is open or that this administration is not enforcing our laws. We need to work together to address our broken immigration system. Enforcement alone cannot fix it. We know this because an enforcement-only approach has largely failed for three decades. We need to update our immigration system so that it meets the needs of our country. We need a balanced, bipartisan approach that expands lawful pathways. This will help relieve pressure on the border and allow people to come to this country in an orderly and efficient way. But Republicans don't want to engage in real legislating that might actually solve problems and deliver meaningful reform. They want to continue to demagogue and fearmonger with meaningless resolutions containing nothing but empty rhetoric designed to score cheap political points. I urge my colleagues to oppose this resolution, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, and I thank both of the witnesses. I have no question at this time, and so I will call on Vice Chair Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Fishbach. Um, thank you both for being here. Obviously, we've discussed this topic in some de detail in the past. <clears throat> Representative Klein, one of my biggest concerns about the migrant protection protocols, the Biden administration early on after President Biden took office was to suspend the migrant protection protocols. He's told by the courts he couldn't do that, that he had to continue. And on a trip down to El Paso in January of 2022, I asked a question of the Customs and Border Protection about the reinstitution of the migrant protection protocols. And they said, let me give you an example. The last days of the Trump administration, we were returning uh, between 90 and 120 people, this was just in El Paso, 90 to 120 people back across the border to Mexico to be held. <clears throat> Even after the court said to President Biden, you couldn't do away with the migrant protection protocols, that you had to continue, it's more like three a day we're going back. There was no intention. There was no, 
I mean, it has to be a priority for the administration. So while I appreciate that you've brought this to us again, and I think it's extremely important, and I appreciate Representative Gonzalez for, for, for putting this resolution forward. I mean, let's be honest, until we change the administration, you can't get anything done because the administration has no intention of enforcing the law. And I don't know why they don't want to defend their own border. I'm, I'm, I'm mystified why they will not defend their own border, but they clearly do not want to. This is not an immigration problem. This is a border security problem. We've been over it and over it and over it. The problem is problem was at the White House, the problem continues to be at the White House, and until we change the administration, we're not going to fix this problem. I hope people are paying attention. I yield back. I would recognize uh, Ranking Member McGovern. Well, I have a different view than uh, Dr. Burgess. Um, I think we need to change Congress because my Republican friends are good about complaining and whining, uh, but not very good about solving any problems. The gentleman mentions that uh, he didn't like the uh, Senate compromise bill that was negotiated by the second most conservative Republican in the United States Senate. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the only reason why we didn't debate and vote on it is because, as Mr. Nadler pointed out, the man that you all fear, Donald Trump, called and said, please don't bring it up. Uh, I, wa I want the issue. I don't want you to solve the problem. Uh, and by the way, um, it, it, the H.R. 2, which you all seem to be so enamored with, uh, when there was a move in the Senate to actually bring it up, it got 32 votes. 32 votes. So not just Democrats, but Republicans. I think maybe, you know, my Republican friends need to understand that we have divided government. Uh, and that while you control the House ever so slightly, Democrats control the Senate ever so slightly, and we have a Democrat in the White House. And the idea that it's my way or the highway all the time, um, and therefore it's, it's just fine for Republicans to, to do nothing about the border means, as I said earlier, you own this issue now. This is your issue. Um, and, um, and I regret that. Mr. Uh, Mr. Nadler, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this resolution <coughs> because I, you know, I'm, I'm, and, I, um, and I feel like I'm having deja vu, uh, or maybe more accurately, a recurring nightmare. Um, you know, didn't we just do a partisan Republican resolution, quote, denouncing the Biden administration's immigration policies, end quote, because I remember Republicans wasting our time with a resolution with the same exact title less than a month ago. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, Mr. McGovern, we, we had the exact same resolution. In fact, it was a cut and paste job. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm, like, I'm looking up the 32 whereas clauses, 13 are identical to the waste of time resolution we did last month. As I said, it was a yeah. cut and paste job. Yeah. And another, you know, and, and, and three others are nearly identical. So, so that means not only are we doing another non-binding non resolution, because am I correct, if this were to pass, no laws change. No Correct. additional money goes to the Border Patrol. No additional money goes to judges to adjudicate. I mean, nothing really changes. It's nothing like really changes. Right. This is a purely political stunt. So, so we're, I mean, you could do a one-minute speech and have the same impact as doing this on the floor. I mean, this, yes. because it, it's, it's a press release. So this is just one more of the same from this Republican majority. No new ideas, uh, no idea on how to govern, no idea on any solutions. I mean, Ranking Member Nadler, other than con continuing to do this absurd nonsense that accomplishes nothing, is there anything else that your committee could be working on uh, and bringing up, bring to the floor that will actually help uh, the American people on this matter? Well, there is one thing, and that is FISA, right. and uh, I hope that that uh, and we, we we were at this committee uh, earlier today with FISA, and uh, I don't know if that's going to if 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 uh, the renewal is going to pass or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think of all the issues that, you know, that are before us that we could actually do something about, including on border security. I mean, I mean, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate came together. The second most conservative Republican in the United States Senate came forward with an idea. Maybe it's not perfect, but the idea is that my Republican friends in the House would rather do nothing other than bring non-binding resolutions to the floor time and time and time again. This place is becoming a joke. Um, and quite frankly, these are matters that deserve serious and thoughtful attention. 
and serious, thoughtful legislation. And this is not it. Yes. And in fact, uh, uh, Mr. McGovern, uh, it was not too long ago that uh, uh, Chip Roy said that this Congress had accomplished nothing at all. And he was right. And I, you know, and, and I, I can't believe I'm saying I, I actually agree with Chip Roy on that. I don't agree with him on anything, but I will agree with him on that, that that, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, this has been a, a total waste of time. And again, it, you know, I always tell people, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. Um, and there are some things that we can come together and agree on, uh, on border security that we can get done immediately. Um, and my uh, Republican friends choose instead to basically do a press release. Um, I, I don't, I mean, this is the same thing we've done before, so I will yield back my time. Thank you. Um, I would recognize Mr. Massey. I have no question. Mrs. Scanlon? Um, yeah, as was just noted, this isn't just the second time we've had this resolution. It's the third time. So in January, there was a resolution denouncing the Biden administration's border policy and then in March, we had another resolution denouncing the Biden administration's border policy, and now we have this one. We get it. You don't like President Biden, and you don't like the border policy, and you have no intention of actually passing a border security bill. So and we have to pass the same resolution every other month. Right. Well, that's because nothing else is happening. Um, but I, I do appreciate your coming to testify yet again, and I don't appreciate the fact that we're wasting so much valuable time and taxpayer dollars on this nonsense. I yield back. Thank you. And I don't believe there is anyone else who wishes to ask questions. So thank you for appearing before us today. And uh, the witnesses are excused. Thank you. I would like to welcome our fourth panel, Representative Salazar and Ranking Member Meeks from the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Representative Salazar. Representative Salazar, I welcome your testimony. There. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member McGovern and members of the committee. And I'm here to urge support of House Resolution 1117, and to urge the Rules Committee to grant a closed rule for the resolution. Six months ago, Hamas unleashed pure, unadulterated hatred with their massive, brutal assault on Israel. Terrorists butchered over 1,200 innocent Israeli men and women and children and at least 31 American citizens. The accounts of Hamas atrocities haunt our nightmares. The cruelty knew no end, from burning alive entire families, forcing children to watch their parents be murdered, to rape and torture. And the nightmare continues. Right now, 130 hostages, including Americans, remain trapped and subject to unthinkable conditions. In response to these unthinkable atrocities, the United States Congress united, God for that, Republicans and Democrats stood in support of our most important ally in the Middle East, Israel. Congress shone a bipartisan light recognizing the horrors of what these terrorists are continuing to inflict on innocent people. On October 25th, we voted overwhelmingly to pass a resolution stating that the House of Representatives, us, 
stands with Israel as it defends itself against the barbaric war launched by Hamas. We also said that the House, us, stands ready to assist Israel with emergency resupply and other security, diplomatic, and intelligence support. But in the last six months, many in this country and around the world have lost moral clarity. For the last 16 years, Hamas has embedded itself and its terrorist infrastructure amongst billions in Gaza. We know that they have built tunnels under schools, hide weapons in hospitals, and turned water pipes into missiles. For that reason, the humanitarian toll from this war is immense. But one thing is clear. Hamas started this war and has no intention of ending it, and the White House just said it right now. There was a ceasefire on October 6th. Hamas broke it. Efforts to release hostages. Hamas is obstructing negotiations. For these reasons, I'm deeply concerned by the Biden administration's decision to publicly pressure Israel to stop its military operations in Gaza without demanding the release of hostages or other concessions by Hamas. On March 25th, for the first time during the conflict, the United States allowed a United Nations Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire to pass. On April 4th, a summary of President Biden's call with Prime Minister Netanyahu stated that our president underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. Neither the United Nations resolution nor President Biden's phone call demanded a release of hostages, at least in exchange for a ceasefire. Nothing. Nothing was asked in exchange. That is why I author this resolution stating that we stand with Israel as it defends itself against Hamas' barbaric war and reaffirming Israel's right to self-defense. My resolution opposes effort to place one-sided pressure on the state of Israel regarding this conflict. Israel did not start the war. This war was not chosen by Israel. We need to support our ally Israel as it fights to restore its security, not empower the terrorists. Again, thank you, and I urge support of House Resolution 1117, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Meeks, I welcome your testimony. Thank you. I'm here to speak in opposition to this uh, partisan resolution, which really has nothing to do to help release the hostages, help the state of Israel, or the Palestinian people. It's a cynical and misleading and in my estimation, is really just a stunt meant to gaslight every American. The resolution states that, and I quote, opposes efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza, including calls for an immediate ceasefire, such as the recent statement by President Biden and the United National Security Council, Resolution 2728, which was adopted due to the Biden administration's decision not to exercise the United States veto. Let me tell you something. This is why this is disingenuous and misleading. Firstly, the administration's position on a ceasefire has not changed. President Biden is seeking a temporary ceasefire combined with a release of the hostages. Now, do you know who else supports this policy, who I've heard say the same thing? Actually, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government, who, as we speak, are actively engaged in negotiations to achieve this goal. Secondly, there was good reason for the administration to abstain instead of vetoing the UN Security Council resolution mentioned in, the res in this resolution. Why? Because this resolution came after weeks of negotiations at the UN, during which we did, in fact, use our veto to dismiss some other outlandish resolutions. This resolution demonstrated a remarkable progress in getting the parties to move closer to our position. The resolution, the resolution that we abstained from reaffirmed the United States' position that a ceasefire of any duration 
come as part of an agreement to release hostages in Gaza. This is a good thing which the United States and the Israeli government support. This was not a part of any previous resolutions. Secondly, the resolution thanked the governments, including Israel, who are part of the negotiations to free the hostages. It wasn't part of others. And third, and the reason why the resolution fell short was because it did not contain language condemning Hamas, something that the United States representative specifically called out because it wasn't included therein, further reinforcing why the United States ultimately abstained despite making significant progress on the overall resolution. You know, there is a careful dance of diplomacy being conducted at the UN, one that requires understanding of the context and the process. This resolution that's before us provides no context at all. And when it comes to the process, there, is, there wasn't one. There was no regular order for this resolution. The Foreign Affairs Committee never marked up this resolution. No one knew this was coming to the floor until the last possible moment on Friday afternoon. And indeed, this is the first time ever in my role as the ranking member or the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee that we are moving legislation that needs to pass through the Rules Committee without any markup in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Not one, nothing. This is another sad precedent set by this majority and may well be one to come to root. It is rich that my friends on the other side of the aisle are playing this game of charades while they continue to reject emergency supplemental funding for Israel. My friends on the House Republican side have had the opportunity to pass the bipartisan Senate bill for weeks while they sit on their hands and seem to be appeasing their dear leader, Donald Trump, and it's to Israel's detriment, and to the detriment of our own national security. This resolution is wrong, misleading, and a distraction from the real work that needs to be done to free the hostages, help our ally Israel, and meet the humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people. What Israel needs is bipartisan support in the United States to meet its many challenges. Republican leadership is actively damaging the U.S.-Israel relationship with this partisan game. We should not be playing games while so many lives are on the line. This resolution should not come to the floor, and instead we should move ahead with the productive initiatives that actually help the people of this country and our friends around the world. And I should say this also, without hoping no one gets after him. Chairman Michael McCall and I worked very hard and closely together. And we had this scenario where we try to do things in a bipartisan way because it affects us all. Our country's natural defense, it affects us all. This is not should be a partisan political issue. We try to work together, unlike some other committees. That's why it was very important where we worked collectively after the attacks on October the 7th to come up with a resolution that was bipartisan and that virtually every member could sign on to. We worked. It didn't just happen. We sat down, we worked, we talked, and we tried to make sure because we wanted one message to come out of Congress, the message that we were united. This resolution, the intent is to try to come out that we're divided. And in my 26 years, hearing a member of the United States House of Representatives, these are the issues where we come united. There's no way that we've ever had a resolution like this that did not go through the committee. 
and allow the chair and the ranking member to work it out to see if we can come up with something that we can all agree upon. Not play politics. It's too serious and too important an issue to play politics on this. So I'd say we should not be moving forward with this. We should allow the committee to work its will. Give the chairman and myself an opportunity to talk together. Let's, as we do on a regular basis, and let's figure out how we can make sure that we do something that is real, that will save lives, that will make sure that the people of Israel are safe, that make sure that the people in Gaza get the kind of humanitarian aid that they need, and we're opening up those doors so we don't have starvation, so that we can show that we have the same values. And yes, to make sure that we go after in a way that is not destroying all life, but yes, holding Hamas accountable for the atrocious acts that it committed on October the 7th. I think that we should be able to find that and do that collectively, not in the way that this manner, this resolution is uh, being put forward. With that, I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Chair, thanks both of our witnesses. Representative Salazar, just give you an opportunity to respond to anything that uh, <coughs> Mr. Meeks has just alleged. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity, um, Honorable Member. And uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to be next to uh, Chairman and Honorable Chairman Meeks. Uh, the only situation with this resolution is that time is of the essence. Um, we were at, during the uh, not in session when the conversation between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu occurred. So I think it's of utmost importance for us as members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, to send a message to the world that the United States Congress, along with the White House, is with Israel. That's why we need to move forward, need to move fast, and send a very clear message that Democrats and Republicans, we are with Israel. And that is not of our, it's not important, it's not a, a good idea for our, uh, from coming from our White House to send the message to the world that, that we are imposing on a foreign leader like Mr. Netanyahu, who is under war right now, that he needs to call for a ceasefire and that he has to stop the war right now unilaterally. That's the only reason why we're doing this, and we're doing it so quickly, because this time is of the essence, and we need to send a clear message, Democrats and Republicans, that we are with Israel. So I <clears throat> certainly uh, underscore that time is of the essence, and I mean, I, you all sit on the com Committee of Jurisdiction. I don't, so I'm not um, given the same depth of briefings that you all are, but it, I mean, this morning there was a report that yet another hostage had possibly perished in, while waiting for some resolution of this. I mean, this, this needs to happen. Well, right now the White House just says that Hamas position on the new truce is not encouraging. That's coming from the White House. And basically what this resolution does is three things. Reaffirms Israel's right to defend itself, which I think we all agree. Number two, reaffirms the United States' commitment to Israel, which we all agree, and opposes President Biden placing one-sided pressure on Israel to call for a ceasefire. Hey, the war could stop tomorrow if both sides come, and if Hamas comes to the table in a uh, legal fashion with the true intention of stopping what's happening. Uh, it's, not in, it's not Israel's timetable, it's Hamas's. Well, thank you both for being here. Um, Mr. Governor. Wow. Um, anyway, I, I'm listening to this. Um, you're on the Foreign Affairs Committee. You introduced this resolution, and you just said that the reason why regular order wasn't followed was because time is of the essence. Uh, and it's so vitally important to get this bill to the floor, a non-binding resolution, a, basically another press release. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't have the force of law. Doesn't, have, doesn't do anything at all. Uh, that there was no time for, uh, like today or yesterday, for the Foreign Affairs Committee to schedule a hearing or even a markup. But this is so vitally important, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. You can give a speech, and it'll have the same effect as moving this legislation.
forward. Um, so, okay, now we're, you, that's your excuse for not having the Foreign Affairs Committee follow regular order. All right, what are we, now we're in the Rules Committee. And you're asking for a closed rule? So basically saying that nobody can offer an amendment? Nobody will have any opportunity to make any changes? Um, you know, we could do that and debate it tomorrow. And we, so would you be willing to change your view and say we should open this up or that we should allow for some amendments? Or, or are you married to shutting this, the whole process down? I think that the message is very clear and that we all agree on these three so, points. So the answer the to that is no. The Israel defense no. that the answer we... Is no. I guess I'm just trying... That's not my question. My question is whether or not... Don't you think that these whether, three whether, whether points not, are I'm, very I'm, clear? No. Well, Mike, you're not And answering. I'm sure that you agree with no, that. No, you're not answering my question. My, yeah, yeah. You know, my question is, since you shut the process down totally, I mean, again, this is the most closed Congress in history. It's like Russia here. When the way we're bringing legislation to the floor. Oh, I wish the yeah, Russians yeah, would yeah. look so like So I'm us. just simply saying that you, that you are saying that that you're saying that you are against anybody offering an amendment to this, which could be debated and voted on tomorrow, and this could move forward quickly. Ranking member, honorable congressman, you know that uh, in the House things move slowly. No, and, but, and, but and, we could have a, we, we could have a couple of amendments, and we could be voting on this. Tomorrow. We could have we could have a few amendments. I mean, uh, I, I think I that mean, the resolution stands for itself, and that it what we yeah. the three key points are exactly what the House of Representatives and, and, needs to be sending out to right. the world, specifically and, helping Israel yeah. and, and a, sending a message to our allies that we are still, as a country, backing yeah. the state of well, Israel. Well, I think everybody, I think virtually unanimously, condemned this horrific attack on Israel on October seventh. Um, I mean, it was immoral. It was terrible. We we have all called the hostages to be released. And you talk about moral clarity in your statement, but I didn't hear you say one word about the famine in Gaza, about the suffering Palestinians, uh, about the fact that we can't get food or humanitarian aid to them at scale, that World Central Kitchen workers were bombed and killed delivering food aid, notwithstanding the fact that they coordinated with the Israeli Defense Forces. I mean, not, not, not even a, a hint of, of concern about the 33,000 people that are dead um, in Gaza. I mean, I, I'm, are you okay with all that? And I, I uh, just want to state that Democrats do not have a monopoly on compassion. We are compassionate too. There are 33 thousand Palestinians yeah. that have died, 70,000 injured because of the war. Half of Gazans are experiencing extreme hunger. This is a tragedy. Of course, those kids should not be going through what they're going through. But it's also true that uh, in the last uh, few months, 468 trucks full of food have gone into Gaza that we are helping and that we are treating thousands of Palestinians. I mean, I mean, the Israelis are treating thousands of Palestinians in Israeli hospitals and that the only so you're, force you're, that is stopping food to get to the Palestinians are, is Hamas. Excuse me. Because there me, are excuse three me, different excuse, corridors. Excuse me. The, uh, that is incorrect. That right. is incorrect. Tell that to the, the workers at World Central Kitchen who were bombed and killed. And that was a tragedy. Right, right. But, Tell you know, Israel the... did what Hamas never does. Yeah, uh -huh. It assumed responsibility. It fired the responsibles. It, uh, it, there is transparency, and they... Uh -huh. Assume okay. responsibility. I mean, is, so, right. so it's, we, we, of course that it no. was terrible what happened. Yeah. Of course, seven yeah. people dead. Yeah. Well, no, but I, I right don't now, believe, I don't three believe, more I don't corridors believe, I, are open. The North yeah. Gaza, the Port, well, and Jordan. Yeah. So I, Israelis want the Palestinians to eat. Hamas is the one who's using them for the war of the images. There is a famine going on. Half of the there is a famine are right now. The extreme yeah, uh, right. We, we know there it. is a famine going on. People are starving to death. Hamas uh, could stop. Medical them. aid is not getting to. Uh, to, the, to the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, water is not getting to the people of Gaza. And, who, and, who, and, and why and, and, is and that I, happening? And, I, and I'm not, and I'm Who's not stopping here. stopping it? Yeah, I, I am saying that that aid has been impeded by the Netanyahu government. And that is a fact. Um, well, and you could talk to... My uh, facts are that well, Hamas is the one stopping yeah. it because, you know, it's, remember that Hamas is in the business of power and not in the business of feeding the Palestinians. All right, well, this, this is... This is yeah. uh, anyway, we're in a whole different realm here of, 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 of reality. I mean, the, the, bot, the bottom line, is there anything in your non-binding resolution 
that talks about uh, getting aid to starving Palestinians. I just, if you want, we can work on one together, but I'm, think, no, I'm sure that the, no, the but is Israelis... But in this bill? The question is anything in this bill? Basically, what the only message that we're sending here, honorable congressman, is that we would want the rest of the international so, community to understand so that, that the no? House of Representatives is not... Uh, agreeing with, uh, with ordering or forcing Netanyahu to do a uh, ceasefire without bringing the other side so I, to I, the table. So I guess that's a no, right? There's no, nothing in here that talks about delivering humanitarian aid at scale to uh, people who are starving to death. In, we do uh, not want the Palestinians uh, to starve. But there's nothing in this bill. You know, the correct? Palestinians are as much as a hostage to Hamas as the Israelis yeah. are. Right, but there's nothing in this bill that talks about their suffering. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Meeks, uh, you know, we're here considering a simple resolution that does nothing as, except, as you pointed out, that tries to score cheap points using the war in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis as a cudgel against President Biden. Um, uh, instead of doing this resolution, uh, can you tell us what the House could consider uh, to actually help the people of Gaza and help try to uh, ensure the security of Israel and help get the hostages released? Well, the first thing that I think that Mr. Ranking Member, that is important is we could do this together. And we can make sure that all of those things that you talked about with reference to getting aid into Gaza to stop starvation from happening, we could sit down and figure this out. Not play politics with it, which we know will be a one-sided bill, because that's what right. it is designed to do. If it was, we wanted to really work collective together so that the world can see that we're working on one piece. We care about Israel, its right to defend itself. Everyone has said that. We're against the horrific acts of Hamas. But as my dear colleague has said, if we are real values and humanitarian, yeah. That should be included in here. Well, Ms. Salas, I just said that uh, this is time is of the essence. It's so urgent to get this non-binding resolution to the floor to vote on it that we don't have time to do regular order in the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we don't have time to even consider one amendment uh, on the House floor that comes out of the Rules Committee. I don't, I don't know what your response to that My is. My response to that is what you said. Yeah. That's like a totalitarian government. Yeah, right, yeah. It's not where you have an opportunity to have real dialogue and conversation to get a real result, to get compromise, to work together. You know, it's not like it's a domestic issue. The world is looking at us. And is that the message we want to send out to the world? It is the wrong thing for this body. It's the wrong thing for this country. People are dying. And there is, you know, what we need to talk to, and here's someone who's doing it on a bipartisan manner, Cindy McCain. Yeah, absolutely, with the World Food Program. With the World Food Program. She's the one that's talking about a matter of short weeks that people are dying right now and what we could do. And we could work and figure out how to collectively work together so that we don't have starvation, how to hold Hamas accountable, how to release the hostages. Those are things that we should be doing in a collective manner, not doing this as we have done on this committee. It's not like this committee hasn't worked together. It's not like this committee hasn't put together bipartisan resolutions and worked to try to figure this out. We didn't have to, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take a year to get that done. You have a chairman and a ranking member that are willing to work together. So there's no need to do this. And as you said, Mr. Ranking Member, if you don't want to do that, right. then at least put these amendments and let us do it, have a debate on the floor. Yeah. That would seem to me is what a democracy is really all about, unless you don't want to hear the whole truth. Yeah. Well, I, and again, I... I I, I would never suggest that one party has the, uh, uh, you know, as a monopoly on compassion, uh, but I would just suggest that um, it helps to mention the suffering uh, of the people of Gaza uh, to show that that compassion is real. Uh, and I am, uh, you know, we are all horrified by what is happening here. Um, and the idea that this is how we're spending our time, um, you know, uh, I think the other message to our to the world is that we're not a serious place. This is, none of this is serious. I mean, this is all politics, and it really is, is terribly disappointing uh, and distasteful. With that, I, I yield back.
General Yields back, Chair. Thanks to the gentleman. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for his questions. I hate it when I find myself agreeing with something the other side said, but I, do, I don't think this is a good use of time. Um, what, what do you all think is the solution to the crisis that's going on there, and does this resolution get us seen closer? I asked you first, Ms. Salazar. What's the specific question, Mr. Mayor? How do, we, how do we get back to peace or to a better peace? Because I don't think it was a good situation to start with. But how do we end this conflict? What, what, should, what could we be doing to end this conflict? Well, I'm not a war expert, but I would imagine that that, that answer lies with Hamas and with Iran. Iran is the one that is directing, giving them the aid, uh, giving them the strategy, and the one who gave them uh, the go-ahead to attack on October 7th. So um, I, would, I, I, I am sure that it's in Israel's best interest to do everything possible for them not to escalate the war. But uh, the Israeli government has said it, that they need to finish Hamas if there is going to be peace for them and for the Palestinians. How many, uh, well, let me ask you, Mr. Meeks, how do we get to a solution to peace, long-term peace or even just short-term? Let's talk about both. Long-term peace, we need to go back to what was taking place before with some of our, some of the Gulf countries that's in the region, talking about normalization with Israel so that they can be able to be working side by side. We need to make sure that, and, and, and as I've talked to and my members of the committee have talked to, a number of the foreign, uh, foreign uh, ministers, uh, whether it's from Saudi Arabia, whether it's from uh, UAE who has agreed to normalization, whether it's Bahrain, who's agreed to normalization. These things were starting to happen now so that people will recognize Israel's right to exist. And Israel then looks and recognizes and have a formulation of a two-state solution where people are working side by side, as what took place in the 70s when Egypt decided that there was no need to have war anymore. And in the 90s when Jordan decided there was no need to have any war anymore to try to figure out how we can live and exist together. Does so this is a, the, a beginning of a long-term solution that can fundamentally change the Middle East as it has been over the last 75 years where each side is trying to fight one another. Does this resolution get us in closer? No. This resolution does what the ranking member has said, basically. But if, look, I firmly believe, firmly believe, if the chairman and I had an opportunity to sit down and try to work this thing out and try to come up with something that would be inclusive of talking about Israel's right to defend itself, of talking about the misdeeds of Hamas, but also talking about the Palestinians, the, the, the children, the women that have lost their lives. And I understand that 13,000 children, 9,000 women, and we were also talking about and showing how considerate we were about the children that are now dying of malnutrition. If that was inclusive of all of this, it would be something that the world could look at and say the United States collectively, not just Democrats, not just Republicans, that these are what our values are as human beings. And here's a real solution to change fundamentally what has been taking place in the Middle East. Let, let me ask you about that. Um, you know, the attack on Israel was barbaric and horrible, and there's no excuse for it. Okay. But this resolution mentions there were 1,200 people that died on October 7th, and it doesn't say anything about the ongoing casualties in this war. What, what are the casualties? Do, do you know, Ms. Salazar? I think that we should go back to the real reason why we're doing this resolution, which is basically to send a message to the international community that our government uh, should not be forcing the state of Israel, in this case his president, to get to a ceasefire or, or, or look for a ceasefire without bringing Hamas to the table as well. I don't think it's, it's, in, in, it's the business of the United States to be imposing at this hour on Israel that they have to get to a one-sided ceasefire without asking anything from Hamas, releasing the hostages, stopping the violence, that's basically all we're doing, sending a very clear message. And why the urgency? 
because of what happened last week, the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. We but, came back today, first time of session, and that's why we, we thought that we should be sending the message, and that's why we wanted to vote on this tomorrow. I don't want to belabor the point, but the fact that it mentions casualties on one side begs what the, the question of what the casualties are on the other side. Do you know how many casualties there are? Well, I just said it. We have 33,000 Palestinians who have died and 70,000 injured. I mean, the, the casualties are going up every day, which is something okay. that is despicable on both ends. Uh, we understand that the Palestinians do not deserve what they are going through, but Hamas is their responsible, and, and I, I was... I was, I've been trying to, to, and this happens in Cuba as well, which is what, you have this population that is hostage to people that are only offering one political view, and the Palestinians do know, cannot open their eyes and see that, that they, they, their political elite is, is corrupt and barbarian. So um, everyone is the victim here of Hamas and Iran. I just have one question before I yield back. Mr. Meeks, um, do you... If this comes to the floor, do you plan to vote for or against it? Against it. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you. Uh, this is the second non-binding resolution which tries to condemn President Biden using a twisted, disingenuous recitation of so-called facts. The second such resolution to come before this committee today, okay? Uh, House leadership refuses to pass assistance to Israel or humanitarian aid to Gaza, but they will waste our time, Congress's time, taxpayer dollars, trying to score sick political points and foster division and chaos here in Congress and across the country. So as we embark on the fifth hour of our hearing here today, you can understand why patients might be wearing a little bit thin, apparently on both sides of the aisle, uh, for this type of political nonsense. I, I think we've seen more than enough of it for one day, and we should move on. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I just returned from Israel, actually. And um, Representative Salazar, I, I want to thank you for your leadership in bringing this resolution forward today. And uh, can you remind us once more today which terrorist group is still holding American and Israeli hostages in Gaza? It's Hamas. 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 I, I had the, um, the honor of meeting with uh, Rachel and John Paulin. Their, their son, Hirsch, has uh, been in captivity since October 7th. And, you know, their heartbreak and their courage uh, that they have put on full display for the world, um, you know, is, is he's an American citizen. And we still have six American citizens in captivity in Gaza right now. And uh, the fact that, you know, we have an administration that, that appears to be slowly but surely walking back their support uh, of, of our greatest ally uh, in the Middle East, our, our only democratic partner in the Middle East in Israel, um, certainly undermines that position. And, and we need to be talking in this building every single day about the fact that we have six American citizens being held still in Gaza, and we have no ability to find out from any international organization what the health and welfare of those six American citizens are. And there was a time in this country where, you know, the, it was basically the critical issue in a presidential election as the, the, the care and welfare and when the release would come of hostages being held by a foreign actor. And right now, we, you know, there, there are many um, other hostages there, uh, Israeli hostages, and, and my heart breaks, you know, for all of those families and what they have been through and the horror uh, and the tragedies that unfolded on October 7th. Uh, but uh, to, to, to hear the optimism uh, in, in, in the struggles that this family has put forward and how they won't give up uh, one iota, but they, th their hopes lie with the American people and that the administration is going to continue to keep this relationship um, sacrosanct. And, and, and we need to continue to stand with Israel every single step of the way. I think this resolution is, is an important step in that direction. Uh, and I, I really do truly appreciate uh, Representative Salazar bringing uh, this back uh, in front of us today. And hopefully we get a positive action here. So thank you very much. And I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Is there any seeking 
Time to question the witnesses. If not, the chair wants to thank the witnesses for being here today, and this panel is excused. Thank you. So we're going to move straight into the uh, amendment panel. Uh, Mr. Klein, Mr. Biggs, and Mr. Crenshaw, if you'll join us at the front of the room. Very well. We will. Uh, we're glad you're here with us today. We will uh, go in alphabetical order. Mr. Biggs, you are recognized to speak on your amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank uh, the ranking member and uh, the members who've endured a rather lengthy hearing. And there must be some special place either in heaven for you or you did something really bad somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's good to be with you, um, and I, I'm here to talk in support of, of, of my two amendments, um, which would stop warrantless searches of U.S. person communications in the, in the FISA 702 database and also strengthen the roles of the FISC amicus curiae, consistent with reforms proposed by Senators Lee and Leahy, which passed the Senate in 2020 by a vote of 77 to 19. I appreciate Chairman Jordan for his support. Um, and also Ranking Member Nadler, Representatives Jayapal and Davidson for their co-sponsorship of these amendments. And I also thank Representatives Lee and McClintock for their work with me over the past year advocating for priorities of the Judiciary Committee. Um, as Mr. Roy was kind of iterating to you earlier about this lengthy process, um, I, I endured all of that process, and, and so um, I appreciate uh, everybody who helped us with that. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act authorizes warrantless search surveillance, and for that reason, it can only be targeted at foreigners overseas. And yet, when the government conducts surveillance of foreign targets, it may incidentally collect Americans' communications, but that word incidental is key. If the government intended to spy on these Americans, it would have to get a court order based on a showing of probable cause either a warrant in a criminal investigation or a FISA Title I order in a foreign intelligence investigation. And despite prior efforts by Congress to protect Americans' privacy, including minimization procedures uh, and FISC court certification requirements, federal agencies with access to the 702 database continue to conduct routine warrantless searches of the 702 database even today for information on calls, text messages, and emails to or from Americans. In just one year, the FISA court reported that there were 278,000 violations of the government's internal rules for conducting searches, and you've been over that, but I'm just going to remind you of what a couple of those are, what a few of those are. Uh, two of our own colleagues in Congress, multiple current and former federal government officials, a state senator, a state court judge who contacted the FBI to report potential civil rights abuses, De demonstrators at Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020, individuals present in D.C. on January 6, 2021, even those who weren't in the Capitol, journalists and political commentators, a local political party, victims who contacted the FBI to report a crime. They were reporting a murder of a relative. They were victims, and they were surveilled. A batch query of 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign I could go on and on, but I just found it interesting when, when the chairman of the Intelligence Committee today said, you can't, you can't do this to American citizens. They would have to have been communicating with Hamas, is what he said. Are you mean to tell me there were 19,000 donors who were somehow contact with Hamas? It's not true. It's, it's, it's inaccurate. It's also been publicly reported that NSA agents have abused 702 to search for communications of online dating prospects, potential tenants for rental property. One, one thought his father was cheating on his mother and looked it up. Well, the underlying bill makes important changes to the program, 
such as increasing penalties for agents who run improper searches of the 702 database. Other changes merely codify procedures. Now I'm going to go through that in just a sec. You guys don't want to hear that, but I, 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 I got to get it on the record. The only way to ensure that Americans' rights are protected and that the abuses end is to require the government to obtain a warrant or a FISA Title I order before searching 702 data for Americans' communications. This is the right approach. It's the only reason the government obtained this information, excuse me, the only reason the government obtained this information without a warrant in the first instance is because it certified that it was targeting only foreigners and that the Americans on the other side of those communications were not the targets. If the government changes its mind and its interest shifts to the American, it should have to go back and get the warrant or FISA Title I order. The Biden administration and the intelligence community will tell you that forcing the government to get a warrant before spying on Americans will cripple 702's utility as a national security tool. They will tell you that a warrant requirement places the U.S. at an imminent risk of attack. This amendment does not take those concerns lightly which is why it includes multiple exceptions, multiple exceptions to accommodate legitimate security needs. This includes every 702 use case cited by the government when it has publicly touted successes of the program. For instance, there's an exception for exigent circumstances where an imminent threat to life or bodily harm exists. The administration says that isn't broad enough, that they might not know at the time of the query whether there's, there's an urgent threat, but it is the same exception that's in place in every other context where the government is required to get a warrant or FISA Title I order. If it's broad enough in a situation where the government is directly investigating a suspected American terrorist, it's broad enough here. There's also an exception for consent, which will come into play mostly when the government is conducting a query for the purposes of identifying potential victims or foreign plots or so-called defensive queries. The administration has provided a small handful of examples of U.S. queries that proved to be useful in identifying victims, including cases where the FBI is trying to help companies recover ransoms and ransomware attacks or protect U.S. officials from assassination plots. It is hard to imagine, for instance, that those companies would not have granted consent. And this gets to a point Mr. Massey was making earlier, and I, wanna, uh, I won't want to make that point right now. These are not exceptions, right? But they are exceptions. They're not notifications merely. They are consent. They're going and they're getting consent. But you know who, who doesn't get that consent? Anybody who's not in Congress. You're not entitled to that consent. That is the point Mr. Massey was making. It was what makes it so insidious. Additionally, the base text of this bill includes a similar exception with a narrow universe under the base text of this bill. The F FBI must get it for members of Congress, but again, not for non-members. There's a third exception that applies to certain cybersecurity-related queries. This would enable the FBI to identify communications that contain malware and act quickly on that information. Finally, our amendment would not require a court order to conduct U.S. person queries of communications metadata. In other words, things like to, from, line in an email and the, the date and time the email was sent. That means the government will be able to determine without getting a court order whether and when a particular U.S. person was in contact with a foreign target. In many cases, that information combined with whatever information led the government to look at this particular U.S. person in the first place will be enough to support a probable cause order. Warrantless searches to Americans' private communications undermines both our liberty and our republic. It is contrary to our nation's values. Section 702 may be a valuable authority. I'm, I, am I am assured that it is for monitoring foreign threats to our nation. But you have to protect Americans' rights as well. I've offered an also uh, an amendment to codify reforms to empower the Fisca Miki consistent with the Lee Leahy amendment, which passed the Senate 77 with 77 votes in 2020. The amendment substantially strengthens the role of Miki to independently analyze FBI surveillance requests that are particularly sensitive. This protection is critical because the FISA court is not adversarial, meaning that there's only a government lawyer. There's only a government lawyer there and the judge, and there's no one there to uh, protect Americans' who, interests who are under surveillance and advocate for them. So that's why this Amici Amendment is so important. Uh, the amendment would authorize and actively encourage FISC judges to seek independent amicus reviews in all sensitive cases, and that's important. The amendment would also require that exculpatory information be provided to the FISA court. That is important. So uh, I want to just give you two, two or three documents. Uh, one is 
uh, the FISA 702 reauthorization amendments. So you heard in earlier testimony the claim that um, there was no cyber uh, spying going on, that there was not going to be anything at the at the uh, um, coffee house, but you didn't ask it quite in the right way because the, the, it, it does. The underlying bill actually has that, and so I give you an article um, expressly stating that dated today's date, FISA 702 reauthorization amendments. The second time is not its charm. Uh, and then um, I will give you also, um, last time uh, we were here, maybe it was not, it, maybe it, was, it was somewhere along the pike, I offered a letter uh, dated December 11th, 2023, from the U.S. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which was created as part of the 9-11 Commission Act of 2007, Title 42 U.S.C., Section 2000. And they specifically go in and state there is not going to be uh, um, delay. Uh, let, let me just read from it. I strongly disagree that a requirement for FISC approval of U.S. person inquiries would amount to a de facto ban, especially assuming Congress were to provide exceptions as outlined in the question from Senator Wyden. And indeed, we have, we have put those exceptions in here. That's there. Does uh, the uh, gentleman asking to have his consent to have those placed on the record? I do, please, sir. Without objection, so ordered. And then I want to just hash over one last thing that I think has to come out, and that is this notion that fi there have been 56 reforms in this in this uh, this bill. Part of the process was the one of the reasons that we we uh, acquiesced in so much was because we were told that if we uh, came to together on that base bill, we would get three amendments from Judiciary Committee with the potential for, of a fourth. This included um, the, the uh, warrant amendment. Those included the Fourth Amendment's not for sale amendment, which apparently we're not going to get that, uh, and, and a couple of others uh, as well. We're not getting those. The reason we acquiesced and gave up so much in the base bill is we were told we get that. And now we're told that, that, that uh, there were 56 reforms. Well, I want to tell you what those reforms look like and why they're so uniquely one-sided. Of the 56 report, re reforms that re supposedly represent middle ground between Hipsy and, and Jude, 45 of those, 80% of those, come directly from the Hipsy Amendment. Eight don't come from either, I, I mean, under Hipsy bill. Eight of them don't come from either bill. Two of them came from the judiciary bill, which passed out 35 to 2. And one of them is consistent with both sides' language. That's, that's important. Um, the other thing is uh, 13 of these codify either existing practice and procedures, which are really not reforms at all, or they actually weaken existing protections. Nine of those reforms that they claim that they got are waivable by the Fisk Court. So this is really uh, uh, basically a very one-sided picture when you hear, oh, 56 of these, uh, 56 of these um, uh, reforms are, are coming out of this task force that I sat on, and I sat on all of the task forces that we've had over the last year. And I will tell you, um, Judiciary has jurisdiction, primary jurisdiction. I begged that, that we, I, I requested that we get the, that uh, the Judiciary Bill go, and we were content to actually have an open rules debate, let the, the Intel Committee come in and, and fight for, and, and we all have the, that fight that I think is, is the push me, pull you, that really can actually make better legislation. But now we're, we're down here to this bill, this base bill, and we're having to beg to try to get our, our warrant amendment actually even just get debated. And uh, I, we, I believe we would have passed that warrant bill or warrant amendment, what, six weeks ago when we were here until um, something happened and we, we didn't get to go forward. I, I ask you to make these two amendments in order. Um, I'm sorry to go on so long when you, when you guys have already taken it. Uh, uh, a, a long day, and I didn't mean to make it too much longer, but with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you all, and I yield back.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members of the Rules Committee, uh, for staying up late with us. And uh, I can tell you how much we, we appreciate that. I want to say um, uh, quite a few words about my amendments and maybe the, the bill in general. Uh, we regularly face new threats and new enemies in the national security space, but only, only one of these threats is actually killing Americans on a daily basis. Every day, the poison trafficked into our country by Mexican drug cartels is killing Americans. In the last three years, more than 200,000 Americans have died from synthetic drug overdoses, and that's mostly from fentanyl. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 45. And since 1999, the numbers of deaths have multiplied by a factor of 110. These deaths rip apart American families, they strain our communities, all while the cartels increase their profits and expand their global reach through their complex network of suppliers, producers, and distributors. That's what I want to talk about here. Because when we think of these organizations, we picture them as card-carrying, uniform-wearing Sicarios, but the reality is far more complex. Of course, there are Sicarios, there are El Chapos and his henchmen, but they're a dime a dozen. They exist to enforce the cartel's will, expand their territory, but the trafficking network is far wider, it's more compartmentalized, and it's much more like a business than it is a gang. The network starts with the precursor wholesalers, mainly in China. They ship those precursors, actually usually to the U.S., using international carriers. Those precursors are then picked up or delivered before being moved south to Mexico by freight carriers who take those precursors to be distributed to producers who mix the precursors to create fentanyl before it's incorporated into pill form, mixed with other drugs or just kept as pure fentanyl. They then move it north, back into the U.S., for its sale and distribution on American streets. The funds are then laundered, either through remittance or a Wallace system, or by buying high-end luxury goods, like a trade-based laundering system. And throughout the whole process, white-collar enablers play a role. Lawyers, accountants, bankers. They are the ones who allow the business of killing Americans to thrive and reinvest money back into the process so the cartels can continue to grow in power. Let's not forget about China. The cartels are the ones who make and traffic fentanyl, but they cannot do so without their Chinese partners who provide the precursor chemicals and also launder their money. This means our greatest strategic competitors working with well-armed and networked groups right on our border to actively kill Americans, and we can't use FISA to gather intel on them. You might think I'm kidding about that, but I'm not kidding about that. Not even through the court system can we get a warrant to actually gather intelligence on those associates of the cartels. I am not kidding. <laughs> That's also why I'm offering this amendment, to add counter-narcotics to the definition of foreign intelligence. Right now, as the law is written, we can only use FISA Section 702 to target foreign governments, international terrorism, or countering weapons of mass destruction. You've heard those three categories quite a bit during these, during these testimonies. My amendment would allow the intelligence community to also use its tools against the entirety of the narcotics trafficking organizations that are poisoning and killing U.S. citizens with impunity. Not just, not just the El Chapos, not just Ismael Zambada of the Sinaloa cartel, not just the Chapitos, not just Nemesio Cervantes of the Jalisco cartel. We can target them. We've managed to put them under the counterterrorism uh, uh, category. But everybody they deal with, we have no legal ability to even get a warrant on them. So this amendment would allow us to go after the entirety of their network from precursor supplier to shippers and carriers to producers and pill pressers to distributors because it's these networks, not the cartel leaders, who are actually making the deaths of Americans possible. I know there's opposition. I know some simply wave their hands and say, well, you're expanding FISA, so no. But that, that's an incomplete argument. What we're doing is we're updating our target sets, just as anyone would when you face a massively increased uh, threat and massively increasing deaths of Americans because of this particular problem. We're providing those new authorities because we're getting 2911s every year from this problem. I chair the, uh, the task force to combat Mexican drug cartels. I've done countless meetings, traveled quite a bit, and been shocked to hear from our intelligence community what they don't do and what they cannot legally do because counter-narcotics is simply not one of the categories that is allowed under FISA. I strongly urge uh, this, com this committee to make this amendment in order, and I strongly urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment on the floor. Thank you, and I yield back. <clears throat> 
Rose Committee thanks both of our witnesses for their thoughtful contributions to the tonight's discussion. I have no additional questions. I'll yield to Mr. McGovern. I, I thank you. Um, I thank you both for for being here and um, and. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Mr. Biggs, you make an awful lot of sense on some of these issues that I, uh, I think uh, I, I shared some of your concerns, and you know I have no idea what will be made in order, but uh, uh, I, we, we, we shall see. But uh, you know th this is a this is a serious issue, and it is about more than just you know. Um, well, it, 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 it's it's about us. It's about the American people, um, and. Uh, people's privacy and um, but I uh, anyway I but I appreciate both of you being here and um, I I know it's late so I yield back thank you Mr. Governor I, and I should have said Mr. Klein is on his way back if he arrives we will allow him to uh, talk on his amendments but until that happens we'll proceed with questions from members Mr. Massey from Kentucky is recognized I think when your amendment was discussed, or maybe you were in the back, but I, I don't think the uh, the objection was really to your amendment, and um, because I know it's it's addressing a real problem. I think the objection would be almost completely ameliorated if the base FISA program were were handled differently. So, in other words, people aren't worried about. <laughs> In fact, I think your amendment will probably do pretty well on the floor if it's made in order. People aren't worried about the target of your amendment. They're worried about the byproduct, and it's nothing that you created or that your amendment does. Um, Mr. Biggs, uh, and, I, and I'll be brief, I swear, I know I kind of filibustered earlier, and that's why you guys are here later. Uh, so I'll be brief, but if let me just ask a question of you. You have a warrant provision in there. When, you know, we're, we're being told there's nothing to worry about in the base bill, but if there's nothing to worry about, why did Congress create a carve-out for itself to be, uh, number one, notified? It, you, know, the Cong you know, the leaders, I guess they call it the Gang of Eight, get notified. Um, if a member of Congress is going to be surveilled by the FBI, by the way, I don't, it didn't really say about NSA or CIA or anything else in there. Um, and then also you have to give consent if, if ostensibly the FBI is doing this for your benefit to protect you, you have to give consent. What, we probably, I doubt that members of Congress would need that or ask for that if we actually had your warrant provision in there. Uh, thanks for the question. You would not need that, Mr. Chairman. You would not need a special defensive briefing uh, if you had a warrant necessarily. Now, what I would tell you is, is what, what the Intelligence Committee Chairman, his argument is and his position is that, is that um, these are special interests and that these are subject to political bias, both, both from the, the agency but also potentially compromising politically. So that's why they, they provide the carve-out. Now, I'm not sure that persuades me, but um, my understanding is that's, that's really their position. I, and I'm not trying to articulate it, but I, that's, I mean, I, like I say, I was in there with them for a year. I'm pretty sure how that, how that goes. But, but I think a better approach would be to treat us like the American people and say, they got to have a warrant. And, um, and or... Or do what we say, include our warrant provision, where we actually say you can you can go to somebody and seek consent, like like on on, on the businesses that that they surveil. They, it's an exigent circumstance for the business. They want to get that resolved. They're going to grant consent because they want to. If they're if there's ransomware and they're being held hostage, right, I yield back. May, may I respond? Yield back. Uh, yes, Tim. Did you have something you wanted to add, Mr. Crenshaw? I'll, I'll yield time before I yield back to Mr. Crenshaw. Well, th th thank you. Um, 
Well, well certainly, I, 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 I believe you're sincere in your remarks. Um, I, I was listening to the, to the conversation earlier about this particular amendment, and multiple members voiced their opposition to it as such. Um, and I hope we're not in a place where we, where, we, where we oppose things we say we support just because we don't support some of the underlying processes of, of FISA. Um, and so I think it's important to, to maybe make a few comments then about, about the, the, the real debate here, which is about warrants. Uh, on queries. And let's say counterterrorism, uh, for instance. So it's, it's easy to say that foreign intelligence should be directed at counterterrorist threats abroad. But I might remind everybody that we only care about counterterrorism abroad because of what they do here. And they can only do things here if they're talking to Americans here. And so you have to imagine certain scenarios, whether it's drug-related, whether it's narcotics-related, or say, you know, some, maybe something like a bunch of terrorists around the world uh, talking about a specific location in Florida where they might take flying lessons. Maybe you want to do a query on that specific location. That location would have a name. It'd be an airfield. It'd be some kind of, like, you know, flying instructor course. That would be under the U.S. person's category. Now, if they're just talking about taking flying lessons, you would not have probable cause to get a warrant. But a good investigator might want to put some, put some, uh, draw some lines there and make some connections. And you might want to know if you're following one guy, you know, Muhammad, whoever, because that's the one guy you have a warrant on for FISA, you might want to know who else is also taking flying lessons there. And you would not be able to do that anymore under this new regime. You wouldn't be able to figure out how many others, um, whether they're foreigners or not, are actually taking flying lessons at that particular airfield. And you could use the same logic about drug trafficking into the U.S. Drug traffickers would be talking about specific locations within the United States, and they might be talking about them nonchalantly, as they would, as somebody who's tracked bad guys quite a bit. They never say openly what they're going to do. They never say openly they're going to kill a bunch of people or traffic drugs. They speak in code, um, and you know, they use some degree of operational security. And it takes good investigators to be able to actually link together what they're trying to do. And if you can't even do so much as, as query a location within the US and try, to, and try to map out who else has been talking about that specific location, who has ties to it, you're not doing your job as an investigator, and you're certainly not going to prevent the next 9-11 or even just prevent the next 10,000 deaths from fentanyl production and, and, and trafficking. It's all in the same category. And I think we're definitely misrepresenting what's happening under a query. We're calling it surveillance, but a better analogy would be to, to look at it the same way we look at wiretaps. If we have a warrant for someone's wiretap, you don't just ignore the other side of that conversation. You don't pretend you didn't hear it. The only difference between that and FISA is that there's a database where it's actually stored in, the other side of that conversation. I think a lot of people are under the wrong impression. I know, I know that's not what Mr. Biggs has said. I know that's not what you have said. I think you're under the right impressions. But I think a lot of people are under the wrong impression that when we query a US person, you're getting access to their inbox. You're getting access to all their tech. That's just not true. That's absolutely not true. You would need a warrant to do that under current law. Um, and so I realize that's, 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 that's far. That's a, that's a bit removed from my amendment. But if we're going to be opposed to my amendment because we're opposed to the base of the bill, I felt I had to speak on the base of the bill. Thank you. You're back. Thanks for that Thank clarification. You. Is, is there any objection to allowing Mr. Klein to proceed with his discussion of his amendment? <laughs> I appreciate the, yeah, it's on. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I have an amendment uh, to uh, prohibit the resumption of abouts collection, which uh, mirrors language from legislation reported from the Judiciary Committee in December 2023 by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote. Abouts collection involves the government capturing vast amounts of communication in which the selector, such as an email address of a target, appeared somewhere in communications even when the target's not a party to the communications. So currently the government's only permitted to collect communications to or from a target. Existing law, however, permits the resumption of abouts collection with notice to Congress. Uh, this has been the subject of controversy for many years. A declassified Fisk opinion from 2011 shined a light on this type of collection, uh, noting that it resulted in the collection of tens of thousands of wholly domestic communications each year by the National Security Administration. In 2017, the NSA announced it was no longer performing abouts collection. In 2018, 
Congress amended Title VII of FISA to prohibit abouts collection unless the AG and DNI notify the House and Senate Judiciary and Intelligence Committees that the NSA plans to resume such collection. But this would ensure uh, that the NSA cannot resume abouts collection um, even with notification to Congress. The government hasn't been conducting this type of surveillance for over seven years and has yet to provide Congress with any rationale for resuming it. It's a common sense amendment that will ensure the government may not resume this type of collection, which is ripe for abusive domestic surveillance. With that, I yield back. Happy to Jim, answer any questions. Gentleman yields back. The, um, the gentleman from Pennsylvania has not had a chance to ask questions. I want to thank the gentleman for the brevity of his pre presentation. Um, certainly those of us who are on judiciary have heard quite a bit of discussion on the FISA issue over the last few months, so thank you all for your testimony. General Lee yields back. Any additional questions from ranking member? Any additional questions from any on the Republican side? If not, uh, committee thanks this panel, and, uh, and you are excused. Is there, is there any other member seeking to testify on H.R. 7888, H.R. 529, H.R.S. 1112, or H.R.S. 1117? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion. Okay. Uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 7888, the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides two hours of general debate equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees and the chair and ranking minority member of the permanent select committee on intelligence or their respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule makes in order only those amendments printed in the rules committee report. Each amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in the Rules Committee report. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for the consideration of H.R. 529, the extending limits of U.S. Customs Waters Act under a closed rule. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means now printed in the bill shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule weighs all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means or the respective designees. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of HRES 1112 denouncing the Biden administration's immigration policies under a closed rule. The rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order to consider HRES 1112. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees. 
The rule further provides for consideration of H.R.S. 1117, opposing efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza under a closed rule. Uh, the rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order to consider H.R.S. 1117. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs or their respective designees. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motion. Is there any discussion or amendment to the rule? General ladies, Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee strike section three of the rule, which provides for consideration of the non-binding House Resolution 1112 and insert a new section providing for consideration of H.R. 16, the American Dream and Promise Act. Mr. Chairman, instead of continuing to waste time in consideration of useless, non-binding, and partisan resolutions that don't do anything to solve immigration issues, we propose instead to bring a bill to the floor that could actually do something. H.R. 16 would provide a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS holders, and Deferred Enforcement Departure recipients. It's a good bill, and it's the right thing to do. While it won't solve every immigration issue, it is a great step in the right direction. I believe the American people would welcome it if the House leadership would abandon the do-nothing path and let us consider real legislation. And I know that many of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle would similarly welcome such a change. I urge a yes vote on my amendment, and I yield back. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Any no. of the chair of the no's have? Request a vote. Uh, vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. No. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagus. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Two yeas, nine nays. Do those have it? The amendment's not agreed to. Is there further amendment? Hearing no uh, requests for further amendments, the question's on the motion to report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Yeah, roll call has roll call's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. Aye. Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagus. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, two nays. And the ayes have it. The motion to report is agreed to. Accordingly, Mr. Roy will be managing the rule for the majority. And Ms. Ledger Fernandez for the minority. Very good. Uh, um, I recognize my yeah, friend. Yeah, I, I, um, I would be uh, remiss tonight if I didn't uh, mention uh, my gratitude to you for your leadership on this committee. Um, and I know there's still a vote that needs to happen, uh, but I have no doubt that our colleagues will recognize your skill as a legislature, uh, le legislator and your decency as a person and will name you the next chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And uh, I, I got to tell you, we're going to miss the smell of c cigar smoke wa wafting through the, this side of the Capitol building, but on second, uh, on second thought, you're only going to be moving down the hall, so maybe we won't. Um, so I, uh, but I can't think of any other person I would rather uh, chair the Rules Committee. Um, actually, I should rephrase that, because uh, there was, uh, I can think of one person, uh, me. Um, but, uh, but that's going to take a change in the majority, and that's up to the American people, not to us. But I have to say, it has been an enormous privilege sharing this dais with you. Uh, it is clear that you have a tremendous respect for this institution, and you have always conducted yourself in a way that demonstrates that. And you have chaired this committee with decency and dignity and decorum, uh, 